Donc je vous laisse. Madame, uh, Monsieur. Ladies and gentlemen, we will start our work. And I hope that you have had an excellent lunch. I was told that some heads of delegations still wanted to take the floor on what the Swiss delegates said earlier. In fact, I suggest that we do this at the end of the session given that we're already running rather late. So now we're going to start our third session, which is Financial Inclusion and Postal Financial Services, Challenges and Opportunities. This afternoon's session will look at the challenges, the economic and social challenges, that the member states of the UPU will have to deal with. Stress will be laid on the essential role that has to be played by governments in order to ensure that posts are able to come up with innovative, integrated and inclusive development solutions in order to re respond to the needs and expectations of their customers and the other stakeholders that are interested, that is to say, from the sectors and the state. The role of the postal sector is a driver for economic growth and its poverty reduction, the role it can play in order to ensure social, financial, economic inclusion will also be mentioned. The, the speakers will look at the way that governments can be involved more closely in the postal sector and we'll see how it may be possible to attract more investment in the postal sector. And I think that we will also have to see how we can reconcile profitability with sustainable development. These are often things that seem to be mutually exclu exclusive. Our moderator will be Mr. Ceruti. Mr. Ceruti is a journalist of uh, TV5 Monde in Switzerland. He is going to be the moderator for our panel. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you. Um, chairman, as you've noticed, we've, um, we've, we're rather behind our timetable, so let's press on. So this morning we talked about uh, financial inclusion and postal financial services, which were both challenges and opportunities. The posts after banks, posts and their major financial agencies are the world's second biggest contributors to financial illusion. And uh, the point is to see how they can do better and increase their, their, their presence in this area. One billion people already benefit from basic transactional services through the post, holding more than 1.5 billion postal services or deposit accounts. This would make any traditional bank envious. In India alone, 30 million new postal savings accounts were opened in 2012. And remittances are a key gateway to the formal financial system for the unbanked. At the worldwide level, migrants' transfers through formal channels accounted for 404 billion US dollars in 2013. Panelists this afternoon will address the challenges and opportunities that the sector faces in leveraging the potential of postal financial services. And we'll be examining the role that posts, with the full support of their governments and international organisations, I think this is essential, can play in increasing financial inclusion generally. To start this afternoon will be Ambassador William Lacey Swing. He's the Director General for the International Organisation for Migration. He's currently serving his second five-year term. Just to remind you, the um, Organisation for Migration um, is uh, a 1.7 billion uh, budget uh, organization and uh, which has uh, about eight, five, 
8,500 staff all around the world. And prior to this, Ambassador Swing had successfully led the largest UN peacekeeping operation as a UN special representative of the Secretary General for the Democratic Republic of Congo. And before that, he did the same, but in Western Sahara. He's also had a long diplomatic career at the US Department of State and was a six-ton ambassador. Ambassador Swing, please, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be with you today to take part in this World Strategy Conference, especially since IOM <clears throat> is a partner with UPU and the Burundi Post in a joint project that we think is very exciting uh, on migration and development with the focus on lowering the cost of sending money home. <clears throat> migration is a mega trend of our century. There are more people on the move today than at any other time in recorded history. This is likely to remain a mega trend for most of the century because of the driving forces. For one thing, demography. Um, numerically, there are more people on the move because the world's population quadrupled in the last century for the first time in recorded history. Unfortunately, much of the mass migration is forced migration. More than 50 million persons displaced today, the largest number since the Second World War. As we speak, our organization has a flight leaving today from Sana'a in Yemen to take out the first of 16,000 third country nationals that 38 governments have asked us to bring to safety. Um, the other driving forces, of course, are the digital revolution. Three billion people today connected to the internet compared to 300 million in the year 2000. The uh, distance shrinking technology, budget travel, uh, climate change, environmental degradation, labor demand. All of these are driving forces that mean that now one in seven persons is a migrant about 250 million of them crossing borders and three quarters of a billion moving within their own country. China alone has more domestic migrants than there are international migrants. So it gives you some idea of the dynamic we're talking about here. If uh, all these migrants uh, crossing borders were to form a country, they would be the sixth largest country in the world, slightly larger than Brazil, slightly smaller than Indonesia, and as the moderator has just said, sending home more than $400 billion a year, a total that's supposed to rise next year to much more than 500, or nearly $582 billion. So migration cannot be ignored, and that's why more and more governments have it as a priority. So I want to make three points. The first one I've begun to make already, which is the remittance impact. I don't know why we should have a global debate now on migration and development as to whether migration contributes to development. Of course it does. My own country is, was built on the backs of migrants. It's still being built today on their backs. Uh, rather than uh, what seems to be the mood today of anti-migrant sentiment uh, driven by a lot of other forces. Uh, foreign direct investment and economic aid are much smaller than the totality of remittances sent home. The number would be much higher if it included informal remittances, which people bring back home in their pockets when they return. Uh, they're also about uh, the well-being of our families. Migrants' families benefit because it covers the expenses on food, health, and education. It helps alleviate poverty, and it provides a better standard of living. These development outcomes can be maximized through programs that aim to increase financial literacy, and I really commend the UPU for its efforts. And my good friend, uh, Director General Hussein, is very committed in this regard, and we're grateful for that and want to be part of it. <clears throat> On the macro level, migrants' remittances are stimulating economic growth. They are a source of microfinance that stimulates innovation. 
It creates jobs and adds to countries' credit ratings. So all of this is in, is in the mix. And during the recent crises, such as the 2008-2009 worldwide economic downturn, remittances proved to be remarkably resilient. In fact, in major migrant countries such as the Philippines and Bangladesh, migrant remittances actually increased in this period because migrants recognized their families needed more help than in more normal times. So we believe that my, my thesis is of IOM that migration, large-scale migration, is inevitable because of the forces I mentioned at the beginning. It is necessary if jobs are to be filled, skills to be available, and economies to flourish, and it is highly desirable if we have the right policies, which means helping to reduce the cost of transfer, which is my second point. The cost of transferring money home now is exorbitant. It is too high. According to the World Bank, migrants sent $60 billion back to Africa in 2012, but they were overcharged $4 billion by money transfer companies, which averaged 12.4% in finance charges. This is unfair. Migrants work hard. They're highly motivated. They contribute. But to have to pay 12.4% to get their money home is something that needs to be addressed. And Director General Hussein and I and our organizations are doing that right now. And I'll come to that project as my third point. In Burundi, where we're collaborating in this joint project, the diaspora sends home 50 million U.S. dollars a year, of which more than 10 percent is lost in remittance transfers. If you say the figure is 450 billion dollars a year and you're paying 10 percent or above, that means you're losing between 40 and 50 billion dollars, which should be putting children in school, putting bread on the table, and taking care of the sick and elderly. Uh, there's a great need now for a focus on lowering these remittance costs. There are many obstacles. The G8 in 2009 made a commitment to reduce remittance costs by 5%. This has not been achieved because the obstacles and the barriers are many. Restrictive regulatory framework, a lack of low cost and reliable money transfer operations, and so forth. But we aim to do something about it. Uh, money has been diverted for various fees and costs that are assessed by the money transfer companies. So my third point is to say, let's support the UPU-IOM joint project. We've gotten some support from governments, but we need more. And we will be making an appeal, as I appeal to you now, to think seriously about supporting this, because we have many countries, both in Africa and other parts of the global south, waiting to see the success of the Burundi project because they'd like to have the same project where they are. We want to lower these costs and improve the contribution, therefore, of migration to development. We're launching a joint initiative. The first pilot, as I mentioned, in partnership with our good friend, Director General Salvatore and Ziggy Yamana, who's with us on the panel today. Uh, and we hope that this will make international funds transfers possible through existing postal networks. I think you have probably at least 600 of these transfer points around the world, and that would aid us enormously. Um, Burundi is affected by a range of issues. First of all, they have prohibitive remittance costs that I mentioned, at least 10 percent, more than twice the international target of 5 percent set by the G8 in 2009. They have widespread financial exclusion in rural areas, especially from savings, investment, insurance, and credit services. And there is a lack of economic opportunity for businesses due to difficulties encountered in, in accessing international markets. So the UPU and IOM, we're leveraging the multifaceted strengths of our respective uh, organizations and the postal network in Burundi to implement a project that will reduce the cost of migration remittances. We emphasize this is only a pilot. If it is successful, we will be going globally with this project. Um, it is the cost of remittances that need to be managed and made affordable. And then we will replicate these efforts in other countries. And I'm so pleased to be with you. I want to leave with you a Swahili proverb, because we're talking about Burundi. Kirima ya kirima, ayikuta na ke. 
lakini watu na watu, wana kutanaka. That means simply, <laughs> it's my very poor Swahili, I apologize. It means simply that mountains can't meet, but people can, and I'm so honored to be with you. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. It was brilliant. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Ambassador Swing. So are we pleased to be with you and to have your expertise with us this afternoon, of course. Et pour parler de l'autre partie, une partie... And uh, to speak about the other part of the project, we're, of course, going to ask the Director General of Burundi Post, Mr. Salvatore Nizigiyemana, who has many responsibilities in both the private and, and public sector. He was... Director General of the Telecommunications Union of Burundi. I'm sure you're going to speak about this project that um, Ambassador Swing mentioned just now. Oui, Monsieur le Ministre. Ministers, Ambassador. Hussein Bishar, Ambassador Swing, dear colleagues, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great pleasure for me and also a great honour to be side by side with these eminent people in order to tell you about Burundi's experiences in finance in the financial area and in financial inclusion. I'm very grateful for being invited and I should be very modest in my presentation because Ambassador Swing has just set out the main points. He's prepared the way so my contribution will be to go into details of the project that we're working on. The, the, the project we're working on with his organization and the UPU to which we belong. May I give you the warmest greetings from the Burundian postal family before I start. I'll make five points very briefly. First of all, the overview and general context of Burundi. It's a small country, less than 28,000 square kilometers. It belongs to, uh, to two communities in Africa, Eastern Africa and Central Africa, 10 million inhabitants. It's a mainly rural country. The level of urbanization is very low. Very few people have bank accounts, about 2.5% of the population, and it's a country where this 2.8% population growth rate, the, we only have 10 banks in the whole of the country, and these banks are confined to towns or urban settlements. It's a country where poverty is fairly widespread. Burundi is one of the last six countries on the list of rich countries. According to the 2014 UNDP report. So, in view of all that, the government, which is my second point, has identified the post as one of the pillars of financial inclusion and a way of combating poverty. There are numerous proofs of this. First of all, by transforming the legal framework relating to the post, giving it financial autonomy and operational autonomy This took place in 1991. 
There was also a decree in that same year which meant that apart from being the designated postal operator, it was given a particular mandate to provide um, local services uh, to people far from the urban centres who are generally the unbanked. They're excluded from the traditional banking system. So to come to my third point, the government is determined to combat poverty and it mentions in their strategy it mentions the post as one of the main pillars of financial inclusion and particularly of the, for the implementation of the strategic framework, which is closely connected with the growth of the economy and sustainable growth in jobs. And another proof of that is that the post has been entrusted by the government with paying the salaries of all the policemen of all paying all pensions. It, it pays uh, family allowances and allowances for vulnerable families. And at the same time, in the national um, subsidies campaign, the post has been identified by the government for, to be in charge of the distribution of fertilizers. And as I was saying, the Burundian economy is mainly based on agriculture. So it's through post offices that farmers have access to their fertilizers and inputs, other inputs for the agriculture. And another important aspect has to do with the role played by financial services in the development of the post in Burundi. And I want to talk about all the operations and income of the post. Financial services account for 15% of all that. That is postal check accounts and Post, postal financial system contributes to about 75% of the income of the post in Burundi, whereas postal services and other associated services contribute to less than 25% of its income. In other words, postal financial services are an important sector for Burundi Post and I think for other posts as well. I'd now like to go into details of the project that was introduced by Ambassador Swing. I have some slides that I'd like to see. It is a project, a tripartite project, which involves two UN organizations, the IOM and UPU, and the RNP, which is the Burundi Post. There's, there's innovation, integration, and also inclusion, all of which I will talk about. It has five components in one single project. The aim is to reduce costs of, tra of money transfers. It aims at financial education, financial inclusion, access to export markets, and the facilitation of communications. We're now going to show you a diagram and which uh, describes this project. It is based on the contribution of migration to development. This is why Ambassador Swing, my great friend and brother, has emphasized that. It is a project that aims 
to reduce the costs of remittance services. The rate of transfer is between 10 and 12 percent. And through this project, we are going to find new corridors for the transfer of funds so as to reduce these rates, that, to reduce these costs. It's a project that's going to contribute to the financial education of migrants and of their families as part of financial inclusion. Just to give you a simple example, a migrant, and many of us have been migrants or are migrants, And if someone has uh, someone who he wants to transfer m money to, you transfer it to them for a particular need. Why not put money onto an, an account of your family member so as to so as to get the members of your family open an account or accounts. This is something we're going to deal with in our project. It will have a strong influence on financial inclusion. I do stress that. And it's a project that will facilitate exports. It'll facilitate access to small producers and local process pro pr producers to markets. We are members of the diaspora. We are emigres. We have emigrated, but we, we still have links with our home country for family or nostalgic reasons. And local producers can send us traditional projects, pro, sorry, traditional products to, to us migrants abroad. And before concluding, I would like to stress this because it's going to revitalize the posts. It's going to give them more activity, more work. Parcels and packages are our profession. It's our profession. I'm sure everyone here can understand that. And finally, the project will contribute uh, to improving communication between migrants and their families. In my country, for example, where mobile phones are only used by about 25% of the population, not only the rural population financially excluded, but also excluded from communication. And there's difficulties of communication between migrants throughout the world and the members of their families in Burundi. So we think that a postal mobile network virtual operator is something feasible. And we're going to set up this platform where we can uh, carry out transfers of money, not just to facilitate communication, but to open up a, a new corridor for the transfer of money. And before concluding, I would like to say that we all have opportunities. We have opportunities as the national postal operator so as to improve or at least alleviate the money transfer market and the financial market in Burundi. The postal network in Burundi is much more extensive than the bank network. In almost all villages and towns, we have a post office. Or at least somebody is there representing the post, and we have 140 post offices. So this physical presence is an advantage as compared to the other operators. First of all, because we are, we are close to people. We are local. And, and, and then again, people's trust in us is very great because we pay salaries, we pay pensions. 
and through post offices, we provide the fertilizers. So everybody knows about the post and puts their trust in it. We pay uh, social welfare payments. But apart from this trust, which is based on the services we provide, I would say that what's more important is that we're a public body. We have a certain cachet as a government agency because the other private microfinancial institutions have um, a role to play, but they don't have the population's trust. And one final word, since this is the UPU strategy conference, I would say is that the post involves many players. Mobile telephone operators, for example, give us an agent's contract. But why not imagine that the post itself could set up a service for transfer of money via mobile phone. Platforms do exist. We've looked at them in Burundi Post, so this is a challenge. But as we're talking about strategy, we should think about the UNCIDF uh, Mobile Money Initiative. and see how we can do the same, or even better. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Nizigo Mana, Director General, Burundi Post. And I think we were to talking about trust. Our next speaker comes from Hungary. His name is Chaba Polasek. He's the Deputy State Secretary in State Secretary for National Financial Services and Postal Affairs by the Hungarian Prime Minister's Office. What's interesting, he's got both a private and public experience. He's been head of corporate portfolio of the Hungarian State Holding Company since June 2010. And before that, he worked for Deloitte et Touche, Credit Anstalt, Credit Group, and CIB Securities. He's been involved in numerous merger and acquisition, privatizations, and capital market transactions. A finance professional, so I said, with political experience. Let's welcome him. Good afternoon, everybody. <clears throat> I, would like to very, uh, I would like to introduce very briefly the position of the post and, and, uh, and Hungary. Hungary is a small country uh, in, in Central Europe. We have 10 million people, 10 million citizens, and every fifth citizen lives in the capital city of Budapest. Hungarian Post, Magyar Posta, is one of the largest companies in the country. We have 2,700 post offices, 30,000 employees, uh, over $800 million of revenues in 2014. And we do not have banking network, we do not have banking license, we do not have a banking uh, subsidiary either. Now, <clears throat> I'm not going to talk about the, the traditional mail services. I'm not going to talk about parcel and logistic services either. However, uh, I would like to just note that we are the largest logistics company in the country. In the e-commerce related uh, transportation services, we have over 30% market share. What I'm going to uh, outline here in the presentation would be the financial services that we provide, especially for uh, for people who have limited access to financial services because they live in smaller villages or they do not have access to modern technologies. On the other hand, we would also outline how we address those people who do have access to modern technologies but who would like to use our services. Uh, first, I would like to talk about payment-related services that we provide. One of them are the bill payments which we call yellow checks. Uh, 
these are uh, these are special bill payment nodes that are used uh, for by utility companies, by tax authorities, and numerous other uh, issuers. Uh, would like to talk about the disbursements note that we use. It's a kind of domestic money transfer. Uh, we also provide payment-related services for pension disbursement. Uh, there are a large number of pensioners who do not have bank accounts or uh, would, are not familiar with, <clears throat> with modern banking services, and the postman goes out and pays the, uh, the, the, the monthly pensions. The number of pension disbursements is decreasing, but still we have about 15 million disbursements a year. And we perform Western Union transfers as well. Now, this yellow check, this is how they look like in the old form. They had, two, two, they had a control slip, and like a utility company uh, was attaching it to the utility bill, and the customers went to the post office, paid it, they got a stamp on that, they got a control uh, slip, and the post was doing the settlement. Now, what we have, on the 1st of January, we introduced QR codes on each and every uh, yellow checks. Before that, we started it a year and a half ago, uh, and it was introduced to uh, only a number of, or a limited number of, uh, of issuers. And this is basically, uh, we have to solve the situation that we need to provide the traditional services of people who uh, want to use cash-based services, but we would, since we got a commission for that, we would not like to lose this business, uh, but we would like to also address the people who would like to use modern technologies, modern banking technologies, because our biggest competitor in this segment are direct debits by the banks. Obviously, the banks are urging uh, the, the customers of the utility companies to, uh, to allow direct debits for them because they got the transfer and they got the funds. While what we, what we are interested in is, is to keep those funds and <clears throat> because we do the settlement with the issuers and it provides us a, a huge liquidity to the post. So for uh, what we did with the use of, of QR codes, uh, we have a new application for smartphones available in, in the iTunes store, also in Google Play, and also for Windows phones. So when you download this uh, application, you need to give uh, the, the bank account. You can designate several bank accounts and uh, decide to determine uh, a, pin, a PIN code. And then when you launch it, that's what you see. You have the options to scan the invoice. Uh, there are invoices put on hold, invoices that are paid, and the various settings and help functions. If you decide to scan it, then it scans and it gives you the information of the issuer, the due date of the invoice, uh, the, and the amount, and you can decide whether to pay immediately or pay it later. If it's paid later, then it goes to the items on hold. If, it's pay, if you decide to pay, then it just, you, uh, just a few clicks of the, uh, of the PIN code, and then successful payment, and there it is. It accounts for as a transaction with a bank card, so this is absolutely free for the users. Uh, in addition to that, we also have check uh, this, this white, uh, yellow check teller machines. For example, my mother is never going to use internet banking and she's not going to use uh, <clears throat> mobile banking either. She doesn't have a smartphone. It's just too complicated for her. But she may not want to go to the post office and queue up and pay it in cash, but we have this check paying uh, teller machines that she can go there or elderly people can go there or people who do not have uh, mobile internet can go there, just put in the, the check, optical reading, uh, reads the characters and you can pay it immediately with your bank card 
like with a very simple transaction. In addition to that, we have the traditional EBPP, electronic bill presentation and payment system. So uh, if you register with our EBPP system, then you get the, the bills electronically and you can pay it with, uh, with a bank card. Now the disbursement note is something also an old fashioned instrument, but still used obviously less and less extent, uh, extent but uh, it is used to pay various social subsidies for people who do not have bank accounts, or it was also used in <clears throat> emergency situations. It happened uh, just over the past few years that savings and, some savings and loan institutions went to bankruptcy and we, we got the funds from the, the deposit insurance fund, the, from the central deposit insurance fund, and we were paying the individuals. We are not talking about big amounts. We are talking about a couple of uh, thousand dollars that were paid per, ca uh, per person, and then they got it in cash, and they could open up an account wherever they wanted to. Also, when the the subsidiary of Banco Popolare Italia uh, decided to leave the country and, and the, um, the wind up the operations, we paid the, uh, we paid the small amounts on their behalf. We are also active in other financial services and I have to address that what we provide are financial services, basic financial services, mass services, but with our uh, network of 2,700 uh, postal outlets, we can access uh, a large segment of the population. We have bank accounts with debit card. It's a white label product with our uh, strategic commercial banking partner. And uh, so we can have, uh, they can open up a bank account at the post and they got a Maestro debit card and they can, they can use the, uh, their account. And to them, it doesn't make a difference whether we have our own uh, current account system or as a white label product, we are provided by professional partner. Also, we are selling deposits. It's a white label product specifically uh, developed for us by a commercial banking partner. Uh, and we are selling insurance products as well life and non-life insurance uh, products. We have a subsidiary, which is jointly owned by a German strategic partner, by Talanx. We have a one-third share in this uh, in post insurance company, and there's a mutual exclusivity. They are not selling their products elsewhere other than the post, and we are not selling other insurance products than, than post-insurance company. Uh, we also provide investment services to our customers. Uh, we have a joint venture, a 50-50 joint venture with our strategic banking partner, product, uh, banking, uh, partner and we can uh, provide, we are selling investment funds, again, basic mass products. So we have a money market fund and we have a real estate fund and we are selling government securities. We are uh, probably the largest distributors of uh, government securities to the retail sector. We are selling physical securities because still there is a demand for physical securities, but also our customers can open up securities account and they can get dematerialized uh, government securities. And we also offer other financial products. So we are agents for two building societies and the customers can sign contracts with us and, and pay the monthly installments uh, in our post offices. So we provide these services even in small villages or smaller towns. And we have our loyalty cards that, uh, that is available to our clients and the points can be redeemed, the post offices. And 
uh, as I shown previously with the, uh, the bill payment uh, product we are having, we have a very close link to the utility sector. And with this, we'd like to uh, use the, the entire value chain. And because of that, uh, two years ago, we acquired a company which was the, uh, the largest service provider for utilities in the Budapest region. And based on the know-how, the technology, uh, and the contacts, now we are rolling out uh, this practice uh, nationwide. What we, are, uh, what we can do and we will do, our postmen, uh, our, our colleagues in the post can go and read the meters the utility meters. After that, the, the system of the, the IT system of the post uh, can generate the invoice from the metadata received uh, from the utility companies. We can print the invoices. We have the largest document printing capacities in the country and also one of the largest one in the Central European region. Yes. And we deliver the invoices and we collect the invoices. And in addition, we provide customer service points to the utility companies on behalf of the utility companies. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Very much. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Mr. Chaba Poleshek. That was a good example of a lot of partnerships between the companies and, and, and the post. Notre prochain orateur maintenant, lui. Our next speaker now works for another enterprise, which, well, in fact, he works for the supervisory committee, the member of the Postal Bank. So that is a, as opposed to what was said by Hungary. Um, Mr. Forceville took up um, many different posts. He was also director of external relations, dealing with international affairs and European affairs. He's also um, president of Post Europe. Many of you know the, this. It brings together very many postal op operators and is in charge of the universal service. You have the floor, so thank you very much, Minister. Mr. Connet, Director General, Deputy Director General of the UPU, Ministers, Ambassadors, President, Director Generals, dear friends. So yesterday my, uh, we were told how grateful, we said how grateful we were to Côte d'Ivoire for organizing this meeting. I certainly will do no less than our president, who is also the president of the Postal Bank. And I would like to add a few words on my own behalf. You have heard me say how, how much we, we, were, we, we praised uh, Côte d'Ivoire for trying to organize a conference in Abidjan, but I hope that this will happen one day eventually. So I came here this afternoon to tell you about an example of a postal bank. There are many. It's not a matter of uh, giving lessons on how this should be done, but just to tell you where we're at today. And in order to understand this, I think that we need to go back a bit. We're not going to go back to the Stone Age, of course, but we just want to remind you that the French Post carries out Money, transfer, tra money transfers and has done since the 19th century. In 1920, there was a savings bank that was set up. And after the First World War, the CCPs, the postal check accounts, try, started little by little to work in ensuring financial inclusion bringing in people who maybe were not very wealthy to open their own bank accounts and to use them. And in the 60s and 70s in France, banks discovered the, uh, this idea of a network bank, branch bank, the populations became more urban. And after a while, the question ro arose to find out whether they post still had a future in the banking sector. 
should it continue its activity. And in order to do this, what it needed to do was to adapt. In order to adapt, the, bank, the post needed to offer a complete package. But in order to do that, they had to be able to come up with a bank with with a banking activity showing that the, there was no conflict between its banking activity, its postal activity, and to draw up a balance sheet. And that's how we made progress. But we did it very slowly. It took us a long time to get there. And why? Well, first of all, the banks really lobbied hard to stop us, to prevent us from becoming a fully-fledged bank. And just to demonstrate this, I can tell you about how hard the lobbying was. In 1994, I, there were three of us lunching together with the very well, very powerful Monsieur Pébreau, who is uh, the president of the BNP, who is a very influential figure. Mr. Pébreau told us, that as far as I'm alive, it, there will be no postal bank in France. But, in fact, there is a postal bank in France and Mr. Pébreau is still alive, at least I hope so. Uh, but uh, this was a very nasty surprise for him. Also, we had to convince the government and uh, parliament. Now, why did they back us? Well, because they wanted that in France we still had a substantial developed postal network. And everyone knows that if the only activity is letters and parcels, it's impossible to keep going a fully fledged postal network of 17,000 uh, centers. This is what happens in France at any rate. And everyone knows that part of the population is not reached by the traditional banking sector and that a, what is required is a very special partner for those people. I was particularly surprised by the figures that were given yesterday by friends from Brazil. They are absolutely remarkable figures given the, also the success of Kiwi Bank in New Zealand. The bank the, the post uh, in New Zealand closed its activities and then op reopened them. And we can see that even a very banking-based sector, there is a place for postal operators there. Also, this was a very difficult choice because we have to admit, I am very sorry, I'm, of course, uh, a big fan of the uh, international, the, the, the World Bank and the IMF, but those institutions explained governments for a long time saying that posts should not work in the banking sector and they even tried to prevent the financial activities of post, the postal sector uh, that today uh, find themselves in a very difficult sit situation. So in 2006 we set up our own bank on the 1st of January 2006. It was uh, set up through a law, an amendment, through Senate, uh, which meant that, in fact, the draft law, the, the bill was not intended for that. It was intended to duplicate a European directive. But through a very long amendment, we managed to set up the Postal Bank in France. And today, it is a bank for everyone. It is intended to help the weakest sector of our population, of course, but we do insist that it has to be a bank for everyone. It should be also accessible for those who are more wealthy, who are more wealthy. We have special offers for those who have very little to invest and for others who have much more substantial amounts. I'm just looking at money transfers, and we have talked about that. Of course, we work together with a major operator, which I will not mention here. But many of you know here that we had a battle on our hands for over 10 years now in order to assist the EU, together with the EPU to develop the bank and also for the EMS. And this too is part and parcel of our vision of a bank for everyone, bank for all. 
Now, this is useful for the real economy too. In 2014, we gave 70,000 mortgage loans, 200,000 loans for consumer goods, and we opened up loans for consumer loans to populations who up till now had no access to the banking sector. We also are involved in micro credits, micro loans with other partners. And also, we have also started to finance territorial uh, groups. In 2009, these groups found themselves facing a credit crunch. They didn't have enough money to finance themselves. And the state asked the Postal Bank, which still had uh, which was still uh, cash rich, to fin finance territorial activities and those communes who needed investment and wanted to investment in public services were able to do this. And now 25% of our capital is involved in this kind of financing. So it's a matter of trust. We have mentioned trust before. Posts are, of course, characterized historically by the trust that citizens have in them. This is a case in France, at any rate, and we're trying to ensure that this trust continues to be deserved. And we work as responsibly as possible as well when it comes to the social commitment of enterprises. There are, they, we, we, were cited first out of over 370 banks throughout the world, we were rated first. We have 600 million euros available, and this net result is above the post, the, the consolidated post to what was available to that. So for a long time, it was the letter post that was financing the post. Now the growth of the post is, is a determinant for our future, and it depends on our financial sector activity. Now, another specific aspect of our development is that we did not want to go into this alone. We were very modest here, and we try to look at activities to try to look for partners in those sectors that we were not specialists in. So we set up partnerships with those who were able to promote our activities in the postal sector. So for instance, in uh, individual loans, we got together with Societe Generale when it comes to uh, vehicle and uh, house insurances. We got together with AMA and the same thing when it came to the health se sector. And when it came to comes to financial management sector, we got together with Egon, who is a major operator from the Netherlands. So I don't want to suggest that everything is rosy. By no means, it's not easy. And this because we are financing the whole weight of the network. And this network in France costs a great deal to maintain. It is a challenge that we take on board, but nevertheless, we have to be aware that when it comes to profitability, the profitability of uh, the postal bank is certainly less than the other banks in France. Nevertheless, we are subject to banking regulations, and this has become a much more weighty affair. We are now being examined by the European Central Bank. The size of our postal bank means that we're under their jurisdiction. And it is very wary when it comes to the prudential aspect, whether we, managed to, we have managed to recapitalize our bank on a number of occasions. I know that for other opera operators and for us as well, of course, these are postal operators who have banks who suffer in their activity when it comes to the letter post aspect. So sometimes it's a bit difficult to be able to 
follow the prudential ratios that are required by the regulatory authorities. But nevertheless, we think that the Postal Bank for us is a fantastic opportunity and I cannot urge the governments and postal operators enough to keep this in mind for the future. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Well, this demonstrates the real weight of uh, political will when it comes to setting up this kind of postal bank. Spain, his name is Mario Garcés San Agustín, he's the Vice Minister of Public Works and Transport in Spain. Previously, he's been an Inspector of Finance and Treasury of the State Controller and Auditor, he's the Director of Finance and Public Administration of the Government of Aragon, and President of the Corporación Empresarial Pública of Aragon, as well as Professor of Administrative Law at the University Carlos Tres de Madrid. Sir, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. Good afternoon. First of all, I'd like to thank all the authorities here and greet everyone, ministers, deputy ministers, directors general, and also the moderator. Thank you very much, Mr. Moderator who has volunteered to chair this afternoon's session. And I'm very sorry I can't speak Swahili, but uh, next time I come I will, because Spanish are very gifted at Swahili. And first of all, I'd like to thank you all for this opportunity for Spain to participate in such an important forum where we can describe our country's experience in practice, in postal practices, and in the transfer of remittances. This is a process where Spain is not on its own. We work in coordination with UPU, and I'd like to thank all the UPU authorities here for their magnificent cooperation, and for their discipline and their commitment to our country to continue cooperating with us and also with PUASP. We're also part of a collective, comprehensive project together with 10 Latin American countries and Portugal and Morocco in opening up certain corridors to ensure that remittances reach their final um, receivers. Ambassador Lacey was saying that the world is characterized by migration flows and by social flows. We have a completely globalized population where we have to find channels for relationships that are not only family or emotional but also financial. Throughout the 20th century, we were an emigrant country. Switzerland, for example, saw many Spaniards arrive here in the 60s, 70s and 80s. But now Spain, in turn, is receiving very large numbers of migrants from other countries. I'm going to give you some data so that you can see the size of this population explosion, of this flow, this migratory flow that has happened in our country. 3.5 of the population of Ecuador lives in Spain at the post. 2.6% of the original population of Bolivia lives in Spain. Or 2.3% of the original population of Morocco lives in Spain at the moment. And here, I would like to thank all those people and all those countries for their immense contribution to the Spanish economy and uh, therefore reciprocally and uh, through international cooperation we would like to ensure that the remittances sent by those citizens to their own countries flow through the throw through uh, secure channels to their own countries because they bring added value to Spain but also to their own countries from which they've emigrated. 
So in a globalized world, public operators, other institutions and international obligations have an obligation, have an obligation uh, to do this, because otherwise we wouldn't be proper public servants. So we're going to be providing resources and ideas uh, to any international organization involved in this. We took part in the Nairobi Strategic Conference, and that's when we first put forward our Correos Hero project. We reached agreements with international organizations, and we wanted to show that the posts can operate on the same con competitive basis and uh, providing the same financial services as the traditional financial institutions. And we're now in a position to say that thanks to the cooperation of all, thanks to the cooperation of the countries of destination and of international organizations, and thanks, of course, thanks to the Spanish post office, this is now a reality. And you can see the results of this work um, in many families throughout the world. We've also supported the Doha strategy. And we'll go to the Istanbul Congress next year, uh, where the project, we believe, should continue to be consolidate, be be become stronger. In Latin America and Caribbean, about that's about a nineteen percent um, income from remittances. So this is a big issue. It's it's a question of defining how, what is financial inclusion. This expression, financial inclusion provides basic financial, means providing basic financial services to everyone in an integrated system. Where might there be major problems? Well, logically, where people are living in remote areas or in poor areas or scarcely, sparsely settled areas. So all these factors, together with migrations, have to be taken into account. And this is why we have called it postal financial inclusion. Data is eloquent, not only in Spain, but in the rest of the world. In 2013, remittances in the world accounted for $414,000 million, and I think we might be 515,000. In other words, in three years this year, in other words, it's, there's been an increase in about 33% in remittances. But for many countries, remittances are almost a third of their GDP. So this is nothing, not, this is very important. It is not just a question of maintaining family ties. It also affects the society and economy of a country. There are more than 600,000 post offices throughout the world. And about 5 million, 5.5 million involved, uh, employed by the post offices of the world. In other words, the post can office their customers permanent services in competition with the most advanced financial agents. But in order to provide that service, obviously we have to provide a quality service that's guaranteed, that's profitable, and that's more economical. And obviously we have to be more competitive, because if we weren't so cooperative, then obviously we would have problems. I'm going to give you some idea of what happens in Spain. 
So you can see how the immigrant population of Spain is responding to this, to this demand for public service. 11.5 of the population, as I was saying, are immigrants. And out of And out of these 5.5 million immigrants in Spain, 1.7 million are from Latin America and the Caribbean. In fact, we're the third European Union country in terms of remittances and the amount of remittances sent. 19% of outgoing EU remittances come from Spain at present. Remittances from Europe, in particular from Spain, are the at ten percent of GDP? These this type of remi these type of remittances have a dynamizing effect on the economy and on society. Many studies have been made on this. Many of them connected to with what our country has been done. Transfers of money have effects on children, on the psycho. A social development of children. They reduce infection or psychological upsets because this growth benefits all areas of activity. Um, not only the social area but also health. We're going to support this project. We consider it to be a good one, a safe one, and it's good for our country, but not only for our country, but for the whole of the international community and obviously for all the receiving countries. In 2007, we signed the first memorandum with the Secretary General of the International Bureau of the UPU. And on the 28th of July, 2008, we signed an agreement for the introduction of the Correos Giro system with Chile and Uruguay. And then in 2010, we enlarged the territorial scope to other important countries in Latin America, such as Argentina, Colombia, Costa Rica, Cuba, Ecuador, Peru, and the Dominican Republic. Apart from Latin America, we also signed agreements with Portugal and Morocco. The current situation, where well, I'm going to give you some data here, because I think we can be very proud. It's not just national pride. It's pride in doing things well and being of service to our citizens and international organizations. So in 2014, from Spain, remittances reached about 17 million euros in value. Sustained growth, which has been continuing over the last few years. Double-digit growth, and I'm sure it will be kept up in the next few years. Second, if we examine the number of transfers, look at the exponential growth that's happened. In 2011, there were 32,500 in 2014. 85,300. It has to be an economical, attractive service that's attractive to citizens. Because apart from asking for secure and attractive services, they want the ones that are not too expensive. And the costs are under 3%, which means uh, that postal transfers are very competitive with the other remittance sending agencies. And I'd like to conclude by repeating Spain's commitment I'd like to repeat that we are committed to this whole process. We will come to the next strategy conference if we can. And our commitment to develop markets based on three principles, which we believe are three essential, very important principles. First of all, 
the system set up should be competitive. If we're not competitive, we're not going to win in an integrated market such as the international financial market. Second, it should be a top quality service. Third, it should be a reliable and secure service. If the projects receive these guarantees, then we're quite certain that we will continue to cooperate here because success will be guaranteed. Thank you. That's fine. That was very interesting. Thank you very much. Cheers. Um, as you probably all noticed, time is flying by very, 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 very rapidly. So we'll, I'm just going to have, I don't know, we'll see how many questions I can ask or how many answers we'll have, <laughs> given the time schedule. Uh, as an outsider, what strikes me, and the, I think the example that was given by uh, La Banque Postale in France, it shows that there is a political will behind it. And uh, as Mr. San Agustin was saying, you need uh, to be competitive, you need quality, you need uh, to be trusted, but also you need a political will to back the whole thing, or else lobbies or traditional banks will never agree or let this happen or let postal banks uh, gain, gain ground. So um, how, how do you see I'm going to ask each of you, how, how do you see this? How is it easy or difficult to convince government, or how much government should actually uh, be part of the process of helping postal banks appear on the market? I'll, I'll start maybe with Mr. Forceville, who has that, that experience. Well, Thank you. I'm not sure if I'm the best person to ask to respond to this question, but what I can say is that we have advised recently in the past a number of countries in this field, postal, in their postal systems, and each time we felt that in order to make progress, we needed to make a political choice here. So maybe the government is already um, convinced of this for a number of reasons, but sometimes you have to go bef uh, put this to the central banks, and that can be a difficult moment because the central banks often have people working for them who are bankers, who and sometimes the, this vision of uh, this idea of the professional qualities of the postal workers is uh, sometimes placed under doubt, quite, uh, quite unwarranted, as we feel at any rate. But we need to convince them, we need to convince key people in government, in uh, at the state level, to overcome this obstacle. And I can give you a number of examples uh, of this in many countries. I won't give this, uh, I won't do this now, but yes, in a certain number of countries, it was very difficult to, do, to make progress along those lines. Well, if, if any, in Hungary, for example, to uh, come up with a postal bank. There's not such a will to have a postal bank as it is, but the, <clears throat> but the fact that, uh, that the post is providing services to, uh, to the large number of people and to provide services to, to people who otherwise would not necessarily have access to financial markets, would not necessarily have access to financial services, it does meet the intention of the government. In addition to that, uh, the Hungarian Post signed a strategic cooperation agreement with the savings and loan cooperatives, which means that over the time there will be, uh, we will have to elaborate on the, on the synergies between the two institutions since the post has 2,700 outlets and the savings and loan cooperatives have 1,600 outlets, which, which means that they have the, the largest network in the country and they can reach people in remote villages or in small towns and people who otherwise may not have uh, easy and convenient access to financial services. In Burundi, par contre, vous avez expliqué qu'il y a une... In Burundi, however, you explained that there is a real political will to support and uh, make the posts available to the population. Confirm, uh, je... 
Yes, I can confirm that. I said, as I said in my introduction, it is part of government policy. We have a national framework for growth and um, combating poverty, and the post was identified as one of the pillars for implementing one of the most important parts of this strategy, that is the, the transformation of the economy into a sustainable economy and to lead to the creation of more jobs. It could only be done like this in Burundi. It is an essentially rural country which is sparsely populated. It is very little urbanized. 10 to 12 percent of the population live in towns or villages or, or, or towns or cities. So the post is the most extensive local network. It is close to people geographically. If we want to get away from uh, poverty, I don't think we can do that without people becoming banked, opening bank accounts. And I think we should offer the post, which, it ha which has the public network, this opportunity. It is autonomy. It has its autonomy as regards um, financial operation, but it is a government body. And the, the political will is there to do this. And another aspect, to return to your question, at a time when we're talking about convergence, banks in our country are very limited. They're confined to towns and urban centers. I don't think there is really any alternative to the post, at least under present circumstances, than for the government to give the post this mandate to ensure financial inclusion. In March 2011, there was a decree that organized the post and it set up in the post a financial department. And one of its missions was to mobilize savings. Another is to provide micro-insurance services or to provide a credit to production units in the countryside. I'll get to you, Ambassador Swing, just to speak about remittances, but one last question to you, Mr. Son Augustine. Do you think, do you have the impression that maybe governments, at least here in Western countries, it's fully understandable what was explained for Burundi, but we have the feeling in Western countries that governments tend to uh, uh, fade away uh, rather than step in. Um, do, do we need, do the Post needs more uh, government just for the banking system, for example? Well, in the case of Spain, first of all, the actual situation of Spain, where we have a very consolidated financial sector with the many national and foreign banks, obviously the post can't compete on the financial market with these great um, entities in Spain. Correos is not a national bank from the point of view of the Spanish financial system. However, we do have the certainty that Correos can provide great service in particular countries, particularly where these migratory flows take place, and to be able to position the financial resources and, uh, obtained in Spain and send them to their destination. What is provided by the banks? What is provided by the post? What's the value added? That's what we have to identify because citizens in a market economy choose what they think is the best and most efficient service. What does the post office offer? 
Uh, first of all, a, a far-flung network of post offices, which accepts those remittances, and it's much more extensive and much more stable than uh, the financial institutions, strictly speaking. And from the point of view of price, the post is very competitive, so we can compete with other possible agents and competitors on the market. And then there's a plus, very important, the brand. It offers this brand of uh, trust, security. It's very odd, but citizens in the public sphere still think that the post is going to guarantee delivery of their remittance in, in the right time and in the right conditions. Now, there are some uh, other operators in competition with, with the post, but once we consolidate our brand, then, then that's half the battle. When, um, there is one service where uh, people tend to privilege uh, private operators rather than, than postal bank, it's remittances. Um, what would you ask? We both are clients <laughs> today. What would you ask? In order, to, oh, what, are, what solutions do you have maybe to use more of the post and maybe to cut down the costs, which are exorbitant, as you were saying, for remittances? Look, to be, uh, to be very frank and to give you more of a global uh, perspective on this, I think that we have, we're living in a period of uh, the world is sort of in disarray. We have more conflicts than at any other time in recorded history. And along with that has come a great distrust of migration. The anti-migrant sentiment is very rampant in the world. And so globally speaking, I think the two things have to happen, the two greatest challenges. Number one, we've got to begin to change the narrative about migration. I'm very grateful that the Swiss television and radio is involved here because the word needs to get out there that migrants are a positive force for development. They're not negative. But we're dealing with a lot of stereotypes. Charlie Hebdo, you got the anti, you got the whole question. Every tourist is a possible terrorist, so you got to deal with that. You have to deal. Maybe they're coming to take our jobs. Maybe they're bringing in disease. You know, all of that. You have to. We have to get rid of those stereotypes and get back to the reality that we all need migrants. Migrants contribute. If you can't change that narrative, then you're going to have trouble really bringing to fruition what we want to do with Burundi and other countries to reduce the costs of, to a normal level, 5% or below. Yes. The second aspect, very much related to that, is that we have to know that we're dealing with a situation where there's going to be inexorably, countries are going to become uh, multi, much more multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multicultural, and therefore we have to deal with the challenge of learning to manage cultural, social, ethnic, religious diversity. I mean, I'm sorry to put it in such global context, but I think Foreigners. that's the backdrop against which all of us are now working to reduce the question of remittance transfers. Thanks. Very quickly, as time flies, um, how do we get to that 5% cost for remittances, according to you? What kind of solution would you propose? Well, it, <laughs> I don't know if it's a good idea to start with you, but uh, let's start with Mr. Sonnengustin. Do, do you think? Oh, Mr. Forsville, rather? Okay, let's start with Mr. No, Forsville. I missed it, sorry. Oh, you How didn't you listen to it. No, I was saying, now Mr. Lisa was saying, Ambassador Lisa was saying that maybe we should get down to 5% cost for remittances, for example. What, what kind of solutions do you have? Do you, do you think it's realistic to, <clears throat> you know, to go down to that level of cost? I don't know. What I do know is that it's expensive. And what is expensive is the actual handling part of the cash, the cash handling part. And there has to be cash handling because there's a security part, there's a transportation part. This is all very expensive. And if the zone is far away, which is inevitable, it's where the post offices are possibly far away. Of course, we would like it to be as inexpensive as possible. But if we go beyond the cash imperative, we then are dealing with electronic money. That is, 
monetary exchanges that are done by telephone, payments done by telephone, because uh, it's fine to get the money on your on your telephone, but you still need to be able to spend it. And all this requires much more substantial development in the IT field. Of course, it's true that we would all like to reach this level you're talking about morally today. Well, uh, j just to ask, well, what is the percentage at the moment as it stands? Well, it depends which product you choose to send money abroad. Well, it can go up to 10 or 12 percent, yes. For the Express man uh, the International Express Mandate, um, that's the most expensive, but we're trying to promote that, and we have tried to bring the cost down for that. But in a market that is highly competitive, we can't sell at a loss. And so we have to be very aware, we have to try to do as much as possible, and it's true that larger volumes will help us, because the more transfer take place, the more the costs will come down. This is this is normal. This is a, the same for letterposts as well. So we have some hopes that we make progress, but we must remain realistic. If the, it becomes a, it's a if it becomes a universal ser service with uh, the subsidies, uh, that's a possible choice. But nevertheless, at the moment, the costs are quite high. So you share my point of view here. As I see it, as he's just said, the solution is to be found in technology. Today, the posts that were traditionally not really interested in technology now have to get into ICT. And I can confirm that the solution is to be found in um, making all this paperless. In other words, transferring money by mobile means. And posts can offer that service. Then you have to be able to use it on the spot, says the moderator. There are many posts, including my own, in Burundi, who are transferring money by mobile. We are agents for mobile telephone companies or for the banks. But as I was saying, I think uh, this is a challenge to the whole of the postal community. And why shouldn't we designated postal operators ourselves become autonomous operators for the transfer of money by mobile means. It's feasible, the technology is there. Or possibly we could do research into this. I'm convinced this is the right way, and I'm sure that others agree. Do you think it's that 10-12% that barrier, it's unbreakable as long as we use cash? Well, in the case of Spain, the commissions taken by the post haven't, in recent years, gone above 3%. So it's a good idea to fix goals. But in any case, we in a competitive market uh, can provide very reasonable prices. Thank you very much for the discussion. I'll quickly uh, have a look to see if the audience wants to um, add anything. I think we had... Um, we had... Um, L'Organisation de la Francophonie... Organisation de la Francophonie. I don't know whether they want to take the floor. My sight is not that good. I can't really see whether Ambassador Bou Habib is in the room. He did say he wanted to speak. And I've also had a note to say that India would like to take the floor. Oh, um, where is the Indian representative? Uh, hello, yeah, thank you. Okay, please, yeah, go on. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for giving India this opportunity uh, to speak in this important forum. 
I would like to take this opportunity to especially thank Kothe Dawar and Switzerland, besides the Director General of the IBUPU and the Deputy DG for organizing this excellent conference. I would also like to thank the Director General of International Organization for Migrations for his excellent presentation and recognizing the role that post offices can play in reducing the cost of operations. In 2014, the just released World Bank figures show that India received over 70 billion US dollars in remittances, which is about 3.7% of our $2 trillion economy. The cost of remittances with MTOs, the money transfer organizations, are very high, and there is definitely a need to reduce this cost. Uh, I would also like to mention yes. that the World Bank reports repeatedly have said that south to south migration, uh, sorry, remittance, which is remittance from one developing country to the other, generally tends to be very high. I take this opportunity as co-chair of the Postal Operations Council's Committee 5 on Postal Financial Services and as the chair of ad hoc group on creation of Postal Financial Services user group to emphasize to implement the last Congress resolution which calls for the need to develop a common brand like EMS for the designated operators and create a cooperative on the lines of EMS. I, India would like to seek the support of all UPU member countries in this important endeavor of the UPU. I would also like to mention that with over 155,000 post offices all over India, we play a big role in financial inclusion through Postal Savings Bank, Postal Life Insurance, Social Services Payments, and Domestic Money Orders. India will like to invite all the designated operators in the world to make use of our large network to reduce the cost of operations. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. So, well, this will conclude this panel as uh, I'm repeating myself, but time flies and we have two other panels uh, to discuss about. So, gentlemen, thank you very much for uh, your uh, thoughts and uh, for sharing them with us. A very good afternoon to you. Thank you very much. Five minutes break and then we go on with the next panel. Thank you. Thank you. That was brilliant. Thank you very much.
I think we'll pick up. I think we'll pick up a lot of time in the, in the last session actually because we've got an hour and a half. We've only four, got four physical people. Yeah, so. I hope so. Well, I hope so. But it's yeah. going to be difficult since we're still four or five minutes late. Oh, yeah. So. Yeah, yeah. No, no, that's fine. No, that's fine. Yeah. As I said, we can go over 50 so minutes. Is there and... There is. Something else is just. Ah, yeah, yeah.
So, everybody back, everybody ready to go on? We have our panelist, which uh, as far as I'm concerned is the most important part. <laughs> now, I hope you guys have a nice quick rest and we'll go on now with the next panel. So please have a seat so that everybody can work uh, in a comfortable way. Donc, cet après-midi, nous allons... All right, so this afternoon, we're going to continue with panel eight, discussion eight. So this is a very important problem, at any rate, seen from the outside, and I am on the outside. I'm a user of the post office. I'm not an employee of the post office. Uh, that is how to translate the trust that uh, exists in the physical world to the digital economy. Well, digitalization is not new. The digital economy is entering a new age that f features unprecedented challenges for postal leaders. Digital tools are flooding the business environment, provoking significant changes in how people work, communicate, and sell. This, this of course, can apply to your, private, your professional lives or in the private uh, sector. This, of course, gives rise to new opportunities and challenges and pushes companies around the world to undergo a digital transformation. Postal stakeholders, as you can imagine, should not be left behind. We've been talking about this for two days now. Panelists will talk precisely about what governments and posts can do to shift the trust normally associated with the physical products and services of the post can be translated at least as well, if not better, into the digital world and make that trust as strong or stronger. I will ask the Vice Minister for Policy Coordination and the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication in Japan, Mr. Yasuo, Sakamoto to come up stage and take the floor. He has previously held numerous responsibility within the Ministry of Internal Affairs and Communication, acting as Director General for Global ICT Strategy Bureau or ICT Strategic Policy Planning. Mr. Sakamoto, please. Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Coordinator. Good afternoon. And I'd like to express my sincere gratitude to the chairman, panelists, and participant for giving me uh, with this opportunity to make a presentation. I'd like to discuss what role the postal sector is expected to play in the future, while keeping in mind the role it has been playing to date. The postal sector has been playing the following roles over a number of decades by making the most of its greatest advantage, i.e. Uh, physical infrastructure, including the post offices and delivery networks. In economy and business fields, the postal sector has been playing a role to deliver information by letters and postcards, goods by parcels, and money by limiters. From the viewpoint of social responsibility, it has been playing an important role as a hub to connect communities, including rural areas of the member countries. It is an undisputed fact that the postal sector has been gaining the trust of society through such initiatives. Meanwhile, the world has been changing significantly as a change in economic and business field. The world is seeing digitalization of economies, which is represented in the term digital economy. It is said that the internet and mobile phones will split to cover the whole population around the world by the year 2025. Internet of Things and Artificial Intelligence are expected to see new development in the future. Given this situation, the role of the postal sector, delivering information through conventional methods such as letters and postcards, is facing a significant, cha ch significant challenge. On the other hand, new possibilities are emerging 
in the parcel area, which is a service for delivering physical goods, thanks to the development of e-commerce. Moreover, the globalization of socioeconomic activities has also expanded the amount of cross-border commercial trade. In terms of social aspect, nations around the world have been continuing their effort to reduce domestic regional gaps and to develop and revitalize rural areas, while advanced countries are facing new issues, such as collapse of communities and super-aging society. In addition, new global issues that cannot be solved by a single country have also arisen, such as global roaming and disaster prevention. These changes could be a challenge for the postal sector, but at the same time, we should take them and opportunities. If the postal sector is to continue to develop an integral part of the global communities and economy, it must accurately respond to such social needs. Digitalization, including the development of internet, is evolving at a speed that no one could imagine. It is crucial for the postal sector to perceive such changes as a means to create new added values and to empower postal services, rather than an opponent for the postal sector. We should not perceive them in a versus structure. The biggest weakness in digital space is the lack of trust in communication, which is represented by information security issues such as cyber attacks. Meanwhile, the advantage of the postal sector, which driver, delivers information by physical means, is its well-established, reliable physical networks. However, it also has been weaknesses such as lack of speediness and efficiency. I think the most important thing in envision the future of the postal sector is to build a win-win relationship between the digital economy and the postal sector, with the disadvantage advantage and disadvantage of the both parties in mind. There are three key points in designing the future of the postal sector. First point is to accelerate the de deployment of ICT to the postal system. Second point is to create new added values by embracing and integrating ICT. Third point is to proactively utilize postal office as trusted hubs for local communities. I'd like to skip the first point as it is obvious. Uh, with legal to effort for the second point, I think based on recent development of e-commerce, the postal sector will be more and more expected to play the following roles. First, to increase the reliability of its delivery services, which is the core of the postal sector. For this purpose, additional functions such as tracking services are demanded. Second, direct marketing, web marketing, consumer management, sales activities, etc., which utilize the internet. Third, to enhance different payment means, such as payment at the post office, cash on delivery on electronic payment. With regard to effort for the third point, the maintenance and rebuilding the regional communities especially those in rural areas, come as an important issue in terms of the social responsibility of the postal sector. As the world is seeing digitalization flourish, in turn, face-to-face -face communication between people is declining. 
In Japan, where the aging of the population is advanced compared to other countries, employees of Japan, Japan Post, are providing mimamori services. Mimamori is Japanese in the sense of supporting elderly people. The post office offices played a significant role in the Great East Japan earthquake four years ago, providing various services for disaster victims. Post offices, which have been built upon the direct communication between people, can be a great asset in this era of the internet. I think they can make a significant contribution to society as a hub for delivering all land services to citizens in local areas. Moreover, in consideration of the prospect that globalization will be further advanced in the future, it will be crucial for us to make further effort to seamlessly interconnect the trusted network of postal offices around the globe. Lastly, needless to say, postal services are provided beyond national boundaries. To respond to the digitalization slated above in an accurate manner, the role the UPU should play with an eye to globalization become more and more significant, such as developing common rules on introducing ICT and capacity building. As we have Mr. Sanu, director of ITU here at our session, coordination between the UPU and ITU is also another topic that we should consider. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Sakamoto, thank you very much. And since Mr. Sakamoto talked about this, we're going to talk, uh, give the floor to Mr. Sanu, Director of the Telecommunications Development Bureau at the International Telecommunication Union. And he has worked for over 30 years in the field of, um, in this field, and he has concentrated on facilitating the growth of mobile tele telephones on the continent. Mr. Sanu, you have the floor. Au revoir, merci. Distinguished participants, ladies and gentlemen, all protocol observed because the moderator asked us yes. to be very brief. <laughs> <laughs> of course, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to be here today at the UPU World Strategy Conference to discuss with our sister organization, UPU. I repeat, our sister organizations, UPU, just to show you how we feel close to UPU and to discuss here how the post can continue to raise to the challenge of remaining relevant and how to leverage the trust that we all have in physical post postal services to deliver innovative development and business services. Actually, all the ecosystem and the stakeholders of ICT, which is today the driving force for all economies, all those stakeholders and players, governments, regulators, service providers, and consumers are facing the same challenge. The technology is evolving so fast that no matter at what time you go to bed, when you wake up in the morning, the first question should be, what have changed when I was sleeping? And the second question, what I must do to remain relevant? If you are not relevant, you are out of the picture, you are out of the market. So, then the post being one of the major stakeholders in the communication is also facing, are also facing the same challenge. So transforming trust in the physical world to
to the digital economy is a multifaceted challenge with tremendous opportunities. On the telecom ICT side, I would like to focus today on three issues. One, for all this to happen, we need services that should be accessible through resilient and high quality network at affordable price. I repeat, affordable price. Once connected with high speed capacity, post offices can serve as local platforms for a range of essential government, financial, and other services, and thus provide governments and business communities with a vehicle, a vehicle tool to reach out to the hard to serve communities where normal business model may not work. ITU and UPU are currently working, for example, on projects to explore innovative business models to connect postal offices in the remote areas using low-cost broadband connectivity solutions, and we are studying ways to cover the cost of the connectivity from the revenue generated by the digital transactions. Additionally, with mobile subscription overpassing 7 billion, it is clear that mobile communication could bridge the digital divide and become, become an universal tool with benefits far beyond the voice and the text communication orig originally envisaged. It's for this reason that myself, I launched an initiative that I call M Powering Development. M for mobile, dash for uh, partnership and powering development. Because today, these technologies are being well accepted in the most rural and the most remote part of the world. Then it is just a golden plate we have to use for development and go beyond voice. The second point is that for all this to happen, citizens should be sure that they pri their private and confidential data will be well protected. This brings bring us to the security of the users of the ICTs. The recent cybercrime statistics are alarming. The likely annual cost of cybercrime to the global economy is estimated at more than 455 billion, and there, were, there have been a four-fold increase in the number of banking and financial-related malware of some, on some uh, software platform from the first quarter to the first quarter of 2014. Building confidence and security in the user ICT therefore remain one of our top priorities. ITU launched in 2007 the Global Cyber Security Agenda, and I'm happy to tell you that in this front, ITU has continued to play its role as a catalyst through initiatives and programs which are, we are implementing to facilitate international cooperation and improve cybersecurity in each country and globally. The ITU Telecommunication Development Bureau that I led is working to implement the mandate of ITU in the, in, in, in the framework of which we have now 152 countries, member states, who have formally joined ITU Global Cybersecurity Initiative aimed at facilitating the deployment of computer incident response team. With the increase in usage of, uh, of search e-services catalyzed by the use of the dot post, top level domain, certain national posts will soon be counted as critical information infrastructure. There is then a great window of opportunity for, for the post to become a trusted partner in the delivery of e-services to citizens 
and businesses. The Postal Network and UPU are therefore our natural partner in cybersecurity. The third point I want to talk to, you, uh, to, to, I want to, talk to you about to, today is that customer should not be limited, and they will, they will not accept to be limited anyway to constraints or geography or by operators or any service providers. So now we are living in the area of convergence, convergence of infrastructure, convergence, convergence of services, and convergence of service providers. You know, we, we no longer have vertical service provider. We have a convergence of service providers. And this is a new landscape where the assurances of yesterday could become the threat of today and even become the lethal weapon for tomorrow. There is then a need to explore innovative and sometimes disruptive services, business models, and partnership. The universal network and the international international legally agreed and binding mechanism through UPU position well the postal services to facilitate cross-border transfer and ensure interoperability among payment system deployed at national levels through a multilateral approach instead of separate bilateral agreements. So UPU can then provide a neutral interoperable platform, a clearing house leveraging IP, uh, UPU's international financial system to allow various players who are offering e-payment solution to transfer money between wallets from various mobile operators or banks. I'm glad also that UPU is participating to the new ITU focus group on digital financial services, which would provide an important vehicle to bring together various players and develop new joint international standards for interoperable financial, mobile financial services. Now, looking at the future, ICT will continue to open new opportunities. The widespread of the physical postal network make it a perfect candidate to equip, to equip everything. Ve postal vehicles, mailbox, parcel, whatever you want, with smart sensor, useful data about many things. Some panelists here have mentioned the tremendous number of services that can be offered. The post can be part of it. The post should not be out of it because we are in the new environment where, as I said, we have a convergence of infrastructure. If you don't go to others, they will take your business anyway. Better be part of the solution and not be part of the problem. Consequently, I could see that with the, the, uh, in the Internet of Things, cloud computing, big data, open data, etc., are a few examples that are a kind of gold mine where the postal service could find a way to provide new services. The posts are at the strategic junct juncture to use the digital economy as an opportunity rather as a threat. However, for this to happen, I will conclude on that. Each, each stakeholder should play its partition. Government should put in place policies conducive to the development of the posts in their new environment. We cannot assign such an handicap to the post and expect them to win. Regulators who are now more and more converged to regulate posts and telecommunication should play the role of facilitators I insist facilitators, the way they did it one decade ago for the telecommunication. The telecommunication sector should look at the post as a serious client and ride on their comparative advantage to cut costs and make business. The postal service providers should reach out to the new profile of client, particularly the youth, the youth that we call in ITU the digital native and propose services to cope with the need. This is where the clients are now. I'm confident that the post will raise to the challenge and tap into the tremendous opportunities of ICTs. As the Director General for UPU said, posts must step out 
of consort, comfort zone and build its future, their future. ITU is committed to play its role together with UPU to make that happen. I thank you. Thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. Nous allons poursuivre. So we're now going to continue this discussion with the presentation of the Director General of the uh, Côte d'Ivoire Post, Mr. Mamadou Konate. He has a lengthy experience of over 30 years in the postal sector. He was previously Director of the Internal Relations of Côte d'Ivoire Post. He occupied a number of posts at regional and national levels. He's also worked within the UPU and uh, together with the PAPU. You have the floor, sir. Monsieur le Ministre, Minister of the Post, Your Excellencies, Ambassadors, Director General of the International Bureau, ladies and gentlemen, delegates, first of all, I would like to join my modest vo voice to the authorities of my country and Côte d'Ivoire to thank Switzerland and the International Bureau for the great care that we have been surrounded by since our arrival. Yesterday, in his statement, the Prime Minister stressed the importance of, post, of the post and the postal sector and the governmental vision up to 2020 for the uh, recovery of Côte d'Ivoire. This has been reflected by our minister being renamed uh, Minister of Post, and uh, this uh, and the minister was present he here. So I would also like to thank Mr. Bruno Connet for the time and energy that he has granted the post in order to share his vision. In Côte d'Ivoire, we have often said that the post goes back a long way with in mind the crisis that we have just uh, undergone. But we also say that it is aiming far as well when it comes to our ambitions. Having said that, the subject that is bringing us together here today specifically is what the government and what the Post can do in order to ensure that the trust that is associated to the physical services and the product can be transferred, and at least as well, if not better, to the digital economy. But I prefer to say, what should the Post and the governments do? Because we don't really have the cho a choice here. We need to do something. In order to make progress, it is a good idea if we can come to an agreement on the concept of the digital economy so that it can act as a guideline to the electronic, to electronic business and all these components, the services, the infrastructure and the underlying technology. In order to be fully understood, we need to take into account the audiovisual technolo technology and uh, audio services and others. And so very clearly, we can see that digital brings together ICTs as well as all the technology used in processing and transferring of information such as uh, through the internet and uh, IT services. The digital sector means that we're talking about the sector specifically linked to ICTs, the sale of uh, digital services. And so it is clear that the government and the posts have enough material so as not to be left marginalized given this new paradigm. So each and every one within its purview needs to play the role of a catalyst and to 
ensure development in a world that is in full change. Now, when it comes to governments, we need to build policies, build guidelines which would enable the benefits of the digital age to be felt by all citizens. And how, to, how do we achieve that? To take the example of my country, a law dealing with postal codes was adopted which involved uh, setting up a regulatory body, a regulatory authority, which uh, reviews the sector. The law on data protection, individual data protection, and the law on e-commerce strengthens the actions on the fight against cyber crime and other scourges of the digital economy. The implementation of a vast program of electronic governance, e-administration, e-health, e-learning, and the program to fight against a digital divide, and the minister mentioned this recently, uh, yesterday when it came to the press conference, we're talking about one citizen, one computer, and this corresponds to internet access. Now, also in my country, the sector was uh, freed up and the deregulation authority had the role to regulate that aspect to in, in such a way that every part of it is able to play its role and the historic operator it would be the designated operator to play its role in the universal sector. When it comes to this historical operator, it is up to the operator to apply the postal strategy of the UPU and that of the ministry while being fully in line with the developments underway and in line with the with market expectations. Now, how can this be done? First of all, when it comes to the management of our post offices in the di digitalizing them, we need to have available the necessary tools and these were made available to all our post offices. We also needed gradually to introduce ICTs in service development. And here we were talking about digital posts more and more. We also needed to set up business units. And today we have created a center for hybrid post, hybrid mail. We're setting up and making available to our customers, new franking machines, new generation ones. We have a postal express service, which is uh, both international and uh, domestic. And we have put online an e-commerce portal, which is called Sunly Shop, so that whoever is interested, they can go to www.sunlyshop.ci. We're also developing partnerships and alliances with administrations, what we call the state post, and the post therefore makes itself available to the administration in order to be its messenger, and we are also setting up partnership with the tax sector in order to distribute uh, tax notifications. We're also making the post available to citizens who want to come to ha have available various uh, parts of administrative acts and, st and statutes remotely. This way the customer does not need to 
move in order to, for instance, come to their birthplace to, in order to obtain an unnecessary birth certificate. So the post also historically is uh, a repository of trust within the framework of everything that we have noted when it comes to digitalization, the post needs to be a digital pillar. And this is a pillar that will come into force only when the necessary tools, applications and services are made available around the, uh, around the electronic services and products. States are making available various progr programs that I've mentioned earlier. We're also talking more and more about big data, a concept which is not something new for posts, since they have always handled and generated information flows. For instance, when it comes to services to citizens, for our citizens and counters and all this constitutes an important database. We also talk about the e cloud internet in our postal offices as a response to the digital divide. Emailing, joint work, all the diversity of services are a lever for integrating integration between the various postal services. When it comes to the post and e-commerce, the post, or rather the logistic platform for distribution, is a very important element. It enables the post to cover this last mile aspect. And for this, the extent of our uh, network is some, was something that was a plus for us. That is all. Thank you very much. And this uh, envelope tells you that the post is still centered on a letter post in spite of the developments that have taken place. We will write to you, says the chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll go on now with our next speaker. Uh, she's Deputy Inspector General of the United States Postal Service, Tammy Whitcomb. And as such, she leads a team of several hundred employees in an office of, a, of Inspector General, identifying opportunities for the agency to promote integrity, reduce fraud, waste and abuse, and increase efficiency and economy. And prior to her current appointment, she serves as the Assistant Inspector General for Audit, and before that, she worked for the Internal Revenue Service Inspection. Service. Tammy, all yours. Thank you. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you for the opportunity to speak today. I want to take just a just a second at the beginning to explain my office's role because offices of Inspector General are somewhat unique to the United States. Um, we perform an independent oversight role. We conduct audits and research uh, focused on improving the Postal Service's economy and efficiency. And uh, we also investigate internal crimes against the Postal Service. Thus, my remarks here today do not necessarily reflect the views of the US Postal Service or the US government as a whole. Uh, being trusted is one of the highest compliments you can receive. But it's more than that. In a research paper that we recently published, we found that being trustworthy was among a handful of attributes of the U.S. Postal Service's brand. We also conservatively estimated that the Postal Service would forego about $3.6 billion a year in financial benefits if it had no discernible brand. Trust is not only good for organizational character, it's good for business. That has certainly informed my office's work. It's an, it's an implicit part of our job in the Office of Inspector General to help the U.S. Postal Service hold on to the high degree of trust that has been placed in it by the, by the American public. For seven years in a row, the Postal Service has consistently ranked as the federal agency that is trusted the most to protect our citizens' privacy. 
Even more than that, the Poneman Institute's 2014 survey, they ask 100,000 participants to name the top five companies they trusted most for guarding their privacy. The US Postal Service was named enough times not only to be the first among federal agencies, but it was it rated the 10th among all companies and organizations in the entire country. I'm sure that many of your posts have similarly high trust levels. With these points serving as guidelines, we've conducted studies and research and have found that the Postal Service could become even a more trusted intermediary in three broad areas of opportunity in the digital economy. And I'm gonna talk about those today just for a minute. Government services, commerce, and serving the underserved. First of all, in government. The Postal Service is already hosting a pilot digital identity program, and it's called the Federal Cloud Credential Exchange, FCCX. It's sort of an online interface. It allows citizens to securely access multiple government websites using just a single password. FCCX is kind of a software middleman. It makes access simpler by letting people bring their own credentials from approved external providers and then use them to log into the federal websites. By streamlining digital authentication, FCCX reduces overall government costs and it enhances privacy and simplicity for citizens. So why was the U.S. Postal Service selected to host FCCX? Well, it runs one of the world's largest computer networks and one of the largest email systems. It handles about four billion communications annually. So when you combine that with the unique law enforcement resources of the Postal Inspection Service, the Postal Service was ideally situated to support this type of a project. So let's talk about some possible future expansion opportunities for such a digital identity effort. Could this kind of effort be expanded into a new postal digital identity verification app, which could assist with things like processing applications for various licenses or handling requests for vehicle license plate renewals, maybe processing filings for building permits, or even guarding against election fraud or providing disaster relief assistance, as we heard from my colleague from Japan. Oops, I think I had it too many times. There we go. Commerce is the second area I want to talk about. With an address linking capability, a digital, a digital identity verification app, as I spoke of earlier, could also make online transactions more secure. Post could use digital identity verification to reduce security risks and fraud associated with domestic and international peer-to-peer -peer transactions. Another option, might be having verified a business's identity and address, Post could issue a trust mark, which would be essentially a logo that a seller could display on its website or on other forms of advertising to inspire consumer confidence. Trust marks would not assure merchandise quality, but they could assure the fact that a seller has a legitimate business address and is identifiable. Such a trust mark could, might, might even become an international postal standard or could help increase the security of cross-border transactions. How about hybrid and reverse hybrid apps that allow senders and receivers to, to convert digital documents to physical or physical documents to digital to elevate the value of both types of media? Finally, serving the underserved. If the vast postal infrastructure, as we just heard about, were enhanced with sensors, it could serve as a platform to collect information that would help citizens provide better service, would help cities provide better services to its citizens, and could also help postal service develop maybe a new role as a neighborhood logistics manager. In theory, each component of the physical infrastructure, whether it's a mailbox, a vehicle, um, a machine or a letter carrier could become a source of new data. This network could be smarter and even more useful, pro providing almost any community monitoring service. What about using postal facilities as neighborhood centers, connecting citizens to government 
and to emerging smart technology services. These neighborhood centers could serve as broadband platforms to bring the digital economy within reach of everyone. They might also serve as easy access points for government services or even convenient places for people to try out emerging technologies. For instance, today it might be 3D printing, but tomorrow who knows what it might be. Could posts also be stronger logistics support centers for citizens that are temporarily or permanently homebound? Since letter carriers have built up trust in the communities that they serve, could they provide present services or important delivery services beyond packages, such as dry cleaning, groceries, and medicine? Another way posts can help assist people that are currently excluded from the digital economy could be to offer a suite of financial services, as we heard on our last panel, as many posts already do. So you can see that the possibilities are certainly out there. So many, in fact, that the transition to, digital, to the digital realm presents as many opportunities as challenges. It's true that digital services have not yet proven to be especially profitable, but as more people perform more of their daily tasks online, Post cannot afford to not meet the digital needs of customers along with their physical needs, or the cost will be instant ir irrelevance. Talk about unprofitable. So in closing, I want to say that the likely winners in the digital economy will be the ones who understand the very definition of trust. What's essentially is to have confidence in someone or something who they are and what they do. Good character and demonstrated competence, these form the very DNA of trust. So as we go forward in this transition, in addition to finding the best ways to transfer trust into the digital economy, we should also be asking, do we have the necessary level of competence to successfully execute? If we don't, how do we get it and how can we get it quickly? I believe the key to meeting these challenges of trust lies not just in great ideas, but more importantly, in maximizing a workforce that comes to the job every day with strong character, good judgment, and the ability and desire to effectively use technology to serve the citizens of this world and their ever-increasing expectations. Thank you very much. So the last speaker now comes from Ecuador. His name is Roberto Cavana Merchan. He's the Secretary General for the Postal Union of the Americas, Spain and Portugal. He draws upon decades of extensive international and national experience with the postal sector. He was a general manager responsible for the modernization of the Ecuadorian, Ecuadorian mail at Correos del Ecuador and also the executive chairman at the same Correos del Ecuador. Please, sir. Thank you, Thank you very much. Bueno, eh. Thank you very much to UPU for having invited me to take part in this panel. I'd like to thank all of the previous uh, panelists, and I'd like to thank all of you for uh, your patience in listening to me over the next few minutes. I think it's important to look uh, a little bit uh, at the context before and after. Now, what does this say? What, is this, what do these photos tell us? Uh, this, I think, represents what the postal sector used to look like a few years ago. Um, it was just um, coasting down a very smooth uh, river. Um, probably some were doing better than others, going faster than others, but basically there weren't many waves. Now look at the situation today. It's the complete opposite. There are waves everywhere. Uh, we're in a very difficult uh, context. Uh, there are very aggressive uh, telecommunications companies and uh, competitors. There are higher better e higher expectations from consumers. There is also um, unfair competition and a complete deregulation of the sector. So we have to do a lot more with a lot less. What is the current context? There is no money to invest. We have a number of problems because we need to be innovative. I think we've been talking about this over the last two years, two days. We need to be innovative. We need to meet targets. We have monthly uh, targets. We 
uh, who heard about uh, someone who didn't meet their targets in November. And I think the fact is, month after month, we are being asked to sell and do business. So what are we doing? Well, Roberto Gorsueta said that any right implies duty and responsibility, and any opportunity implies obligation, and any possession, duty. Now what this means is, in my view, is that clients uh, are entitled to expect a very high quality of service, and we have the responsibility to deliver that service. We also have the responsibility to innovate and to change the situation in the postal sector. We're forced to find new solutions and look for better commitment and skill in order to provide a better service. We have important tools uh, such as postal reform, e-commerce, financial services, and a whole set of tools uh, at our disposal in the postal sector. But how are we going about uh, postal sector reform? Here it is. Well, we need to look very carefully at the context and say that we're not just looking for new laws and new regulations. We're looking for a reform of the postal sector. And, and that means a comprehensive uh, and structured reform in which governments participate actively in the reform process. Whereby postal reform is a, a question of, uh, uh, of ownership of, among all of the stakeholders in the postal sector. If we try and do everything by ourselves, we're not going to get anywhere. Obviously, the postal sector is a key element, a key driver of social and economic development in countries. Um, the statistics show that we're the biggest uh, job creator in the world with 5.0 million uh, jobs. We generate wealth, 345 billion US dollars, and we have more than 660,000 post offices around the world. We've been talking about e-commerce over the past couple of days. And obviously, we need to increase the volume of parcel post. We need to work on parcels in order to take advantage of e-commerce because we are seeing uh, fewer and fewer letters. And this has been said on a number of occasions. We don't know when letters are going to disappear altogether. In one year, 50 years, we just don't know. So what we need to focus on is quality of service in all of the services that we provide, including letter mail. But when are letters going to disappear, we simply don't know. What I say when um, someone asks me, I might look like a... a uh, a fortune teller or a witch of some kind, but I'm not. I simply don't know. I can't look into the future. Uh, I can't read the, 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 uh, the tea leaves. And I just know when letters are going to disappear. But we need to focus on our, uh, our key strengths, logistics, parcels. We talked so much about e-commerce, about Brazil and Peru, uh, where e-commerce... Uh, has been discussed lengthily uh, with regard to export to Facil, for example. We've talked about the importance of e-commerce, about how it promotes social inclusion, an inclusive government program that we need to take advantage of. Deepak Chopra, our dear friend, um, talked about cross-border post. And he talked about the need to have excellent, strong, cross-border post. And in order to achieve that, we need to have technology, good accessibility, and we need a sustainable service. With regard to financial services, well, we've heard uh, a great deal about that. But what's important for us are remittances for migrants. We heard about that in the previous panel. Postal bank. There, there are posts that already have these services, such as Brazil, France and Italy. And Portugal in November, I believe, will be setting one up. And we can learn from them. We shouldn't be afraid to learn from the successes and from the failures of countries who have set up this type of service. But we need to look at this frankly 
uh, and talk about the capacity of mail, of post, to get involved in this type of business activity. Talking about postal payment services, it's very important to look at the fact that there are traditional services, but we can also be very innovative. Um, postal packaging envelopes were launched by one post in the region and this uh, made it possible to put advertising on all of these envelopes and this uh, uh, these envelopes were just distributed to people who didn't have a, an envelope available when they wanted to send something and this is a uh, free uh, and this is advertising and we shouldn't be afraid of these type of innovative uh, strategies as well as uh, looking at uh, um, working with uh, uh, airlines and uh, um, uh, public transport cooperatives. Technology is moving very fast and we need to keep up with it. We need to be at the cutting edge. We've talked about changing our image a great deal in the region and we've worked very hard to try to change the image of posts um, as cheaply as possible by uh, getting involved in interviews, uh, uh, free, pub uh, free publicity wherever possible, press releases, um, and looking for advertising possibilities uh, in postal parcels. For the future, what we need is good governance of the sector. We need to enhance the quality of service in all of our products and diversify. We need to incorporate new technologies. We need to work with all of the restricted unions and regions um, as uh, key elements of postal development. What are we doing in uh, PUASP? Well, what we have done is try to support governments in reform processes. They are key processes for us. We cannot work in silos. We need to work um, hand in hand with the governments. We've also launched a program called the Cement, uh, EMS Cement uh, Project in order to uh, em enhance quality of service in EMS. And uh, we've reviewed progress uh, after a year of uh, implementing that project, and we've seen that some posts have made uh, great strides forward thanks to this program in the last year. We've been uh, uh, raising awareness of governments uh, uh, of the importance of the postal sector, trying to explain our role and uh, try to explain how that we can how we can support them. We've been working on regional projects, uh, such as developing the, log chain, the logistics chain, um, working on a regional postal security certificate, looking at relations between posts and customs. For me, there is no successful post without security. We've been working uh, along the lines of this Exporter Facile program, which is a very inclusive program and such a vital one for the region and indeed for the world. And we've been looking at the issue of remittances and we're looking for new sources of financing so that we can uh, promote our projects. So just to conclude. I think we need to do post-business in a very flexible and forward-looking fashion. We're not just in the business of selling products, we're in the business of developing the postal sector. And we have tremendous synergies. When mail is sent from a developed country to a developing country, and that developing country doesn't have the technology or the capacity to deliver that mail, then the quality of the post in general uh, will be described as poor. So we have no time to lose. There is no time to waste. The time for change is now, and it depends on all of us. It depends on the decisions that we take at this conference and in the Istanbul Congress. Therefore, I invite you to lead together a crusade for this new postal sector with new services, innovation, and extremely high quality. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much. That was brilliant. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so, I think before, uh, before, before I ask anything, I'll, I think I'll go to the floor this time.
And uh, if I recall correctly, le Burkina Faso voulait intervenir tout à l'heure, mais n'a pas eu l'opportunité. Uh, Burkina Faso wanted to speak earlier, but didn't have the opportunity. Is Burkina Faso in the room? Do they wish to speak now? No. No Burkina Faso. Ah. Question from the floor. Anyone wishing to um, add anything? The Dominican Republic, please, sir. See, Mr. Cavana, Marchan. We'd like to know what is the main challenge that you faced uh, as Secretary General of the Postal Union of these Americas, Spain and Portugal. What is the biggest challenge that you've had to face in uh, developing uh, the postal networks in Latin America? Yes, please. I'm sorry. I think that was addressed to you. Yes, sir. Thank you very much for your question. Well, one of the challenges that we've had to face uh, as Secretary General, is trying to work more closely with governments and trying to get governments to work with posts to try to move forward in each of the projects that uh, we need to implement, to try to make the posts more dynamic in uh, relation to new technologies in particular. Sometimes We've had uh, projects that we wanted to implement before they were actually mature, um, such as uh, projects relating to e-commerce. And so what's important to begin with is to start to implement them. But if you don't have the right technological platform for some of these services, the whole thing is going to collapse. So that's why you need to work a lot upstream and to, to ensure that your projects are successful when they are eventually launched. And this was a difficult thing because the governments in the region uh, are not always aware of uh, the role of the postal sector, but we've been working more closely with them. Dernière question, je donne la parole à la Côte d'Ivoire. I give the floor to Côte d'Ivoire. You have one minute for the question and statement as you are presiding this conference. Um, but I wish you, I'd ask you to be very brief. One minute to ask a question and one minute to respond. Thank you very much. Merci. Thank you very much, moderator. We will be as will be brief as you've requested. I'd like to thank all the speakers for the excellent quality of their presentations, particularly the uh, gentleman from Puasp. I've noted in all the presentations that uh, this uh, significant list of innovations and solutions that we should all be looking at. But I think also we need to think about the issue of. Uh, client expectations. Um, we have customers and governments, of all, all, all the players in the ecosystem. They, we know that innovation is uh, evident for the market. We need to do this and we to respect what our promises, our promises to the customer. And we wish to improve the quality of our services with all our stakeholders and respect what we have promised to our clients. Thank you very much for your comment, says the moderator. I think it's uh, an excellent comment. Thank you for taking the floor. Thank you very much for uh, participating in this uh, panel. Unfortunately, time is really, really, really running fast and we have another panel and some guys, I think, have catch a plane. So thank you very much for, uh, for your time and for your expertise and uh, have a safe return home. Thank you.
uh, one, one more thing before we go on. Uh, just a, a quick question, actually. This is a technical problem we have. We're missing a microphone. So I think Ambassador Lacey left with his microphone. So if anyone sees Ambassador Lacey or, if, or anyone sees a microphone, you know, just wandering around, it's, it's surely missed, and we appreciate to have it back. <laughs> so thank you. So we'll ask the next four panelists to please uh, step on stage. Namely, Monsieur le Ministre Coney, Mr. Jennings, Monsieur Cliva qui est là, and uh, Mr. Guzman as well. Please step on stage so that we can um, fix your microphone and then we can start right away. Thank you. Oh, yeah, yeah, I'll try that, my best. That'd be perfect. I will, yeah, I will try. I'll, I will. Thank you. Yes, you are. J'ai fait l'annonce, mais... Euh
Okay. So I'll wait for, her, for him to come back. Okay. I'll wait for him. So he's on the case. Okay, you give me the go? Yeah. Okay, I'll wait for you. Yes, Mrs. Mohammed, do you, you hear me? Yes, we do. Hello there. Well, good. So you're with us. So we can start then. <laughs> good. We'll formally start then. Voilà. Troisième, uh, so our third panel. Last one. And uh, we're going to be talking about une composante essentielle, an essential component for the uh, global economy and uh, sustainable development. La contribution du secteur postal à l'économie intérieure régionale contribution of the postal sector in the internal region and global economy is more recognized by governments and international actors. In international current context of globalization, the, the universal postal network, resilient postal network, is a major uh, benefit for an important tool to support the objectives of sustainable development on a national level, global level, in three dimensions, the economy, social uh, aspect, and the environment. The various speakers in this panel will review how the UPU's members and the postal sector in a broader sense contribute to the Programme for Sustainable Development of the United Nations to benefit the economies, societies and all citizens worldwide. Speaker, and one of the speakers we have, as you heard and uh, witnessed, is live with us but from New York. This is Amina Mohammed. She's the UN Secretary General Special Advisor on Post-2015 Development Planning. She was previously senior special assistant to the president of Nigeria on the Millennium Development Goals after serving three presidents over a period of six years. In 2005, she was charged with the coordination of the debt relief funds of one billion per annum towards the achievement of Millennium, millennium Development Goals in Nigeria. Mrs. Mohammed served as a coordinator also of the task force on gender and education for the United Nations Millennium Project. So now, Mrs. Mohammed, I'm not going to say the floor is yours, as you're uh, quite away from us, but the microphone is yours, and we're all ears to listen to you. Thank you very much, and my appreciation for uh, being invited to participate in this really interesting discussion with the UPU um, and our fellow panelists. Um, so good morning from New York. Uh, we are, of course, 15 years down the road from when we had the first opportunity of using the MDGs as a first set of goals to really try to bring together an anti-poverty push um, over 15 years. And here on in, we um, have mixed results. Uh, the glass is half full, half empty. I certainly spent a great deal of my life at the country level trying to address the MDGs. So we will regard them today as unfinished business, but successful in that we are debating the new framework for another set of goals this time for sustainable development. And two and a half years ago, member states did make another difference in the way in which we at the United Nations approached shaping the new agenda. And that was by taking the lead um, that 193 of our member states uh, would fashion and shape out what would be the uh, successor. Um, we've witnessed over the last year and a half uh, member states in two processes, one around the next set of sustainable development goals, produce a set of 17 goals and 169 targets um, in really the most inclusive discussion that we've had from governments to external stakeholders in business, civil society, um, our academics. And I think really an agenda today that shows um, is owned, is responsive and representative of the many challenges that we all face. Um, but better still, what we've done is add another conversation to this, and, and that is how would we produce a means of implementation for this? What would we agree? And therefore, the second process, which is the financing for development, um, is also in play. In fact, as we speak now, we have our member states negotiating the first zero draft of that um, 
part of the process to, to see how they would engage with um, making sure that at the end of this agenda, we have the means of implementation. It's, I think, critical to underscore here that many of the challenges in the existing agenda still remain. However, they are exacerbated by new situations, and in particular, the issues of unemployment, of migration, of conflict. And all of these are really reflected in how these uh, goals ought to address it. But it is a new narrative. It is a new way of us addressing development at the country that is not incremental, that is universal and about everyone, but it is also about an integrated approach where we are not taking the agenda of a Minister of Development to the Cabinet table, but we are saying that the transformation of economies, in fact, the results we're looking for are in the social agenda and on the uh, environmental agenda, an integrated whole, environmental, economic, and uh, uh, social. So this, this really does bring in many more stakeholders. It brings in the challenges of how we will uh, look at ourselves as institutions, as individuals, as experts in trying to make ourselves fit for purpose on this agenda. We see here that um, in many cases, finishing off the social agenda and human well-being cannot be done without us taking an integral look at how the economy itself will be geared towards addressing this. And that if, when we do that, when we grow our economies, that we are looking at the environment and some of the technologies that we need to make sure that we do less harm um, and that we really do deal with a new way um, of uh, the demands that we make in terms of our consumption and production. We are, in fact, looking for a more sustainable path. We're also looking for um, investments in sustainable development that are irreversible. And I think that we've learned from the MDGs that anything that we do incrementally that addresses only part of the problem really does come unstuck. And perhaps one of the most um, vivid uh, responses to this has been the challenges that we dealt with, for instance, on the health agenda with Ebola in Africa where really addressing just health issues around child mortality and maternal mortality did not go deep enough into looking at the systems that we need uh, to respond to health as a whole, from the local level all the way through to tertiary care. And I think this agenda really does try to say that in, 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 all, its, in all its ways. The narrative certainly has changed. Where are we today? This year, we will address these three issues, the set of goals that we hope we will have approved by the member states, the means of implementation, but also make a very strong um, attempt to get a meaningful agreement on the climate change in December in Paris. And I think it is important that these three issues that we speak about, addressing a more sustainable path to development, the means of implementation in unlocking resources, and that means really looking innovatively at what else can we do to bring um, from billions to the trillions that we will need all hands on deck for this. And how do we get uh, an agreement on climate change where from the country level we are making commitments uh, to, to greening and, and having a much more sustainable path. So this is a year of um, definitely uh, big, big actions that, that we want to, that we want to um, take and we want to approve. How then do we uh, look at a key stakeholder like the postal sector in this, the relevance and, and the implementation of your role as you look at your strategy? Uh, certainly here, um, we know that it is uh, key that we look at the means of implementation for this. We see that with more than 1 billion people who have accounts in the post office, it is the second largest contribution to, contributor to financial inclusion. And this is an important part of this agenda, is that the inequality aspect of this, making sure that we include everyone, um, regardless of where they are coming from or who they are, um, needs to learn lessons from those that have been involved with this, but for which we have the greater challenge of going to scale, a universal agenda meaning just that. And I think that here, um, the nature of the multi-stakeholders involved um, and of the experiences that you've had within countries, across countries, globally, in bringing together um, excluded groups um, and populations, particularly young people and women, uh, will play a big role in the means of implementation. And therefore, what happens come January is at the country level, how do we bring together our constituencies within the UN system, new stakeholders, uh, to, to implement uh, this big agenda? 
we will be looking at you know how we access information again you have been one of the the vehicles that has cut across all those barriers in providing that but how can you become a much more integral part and substantively that information that we're carrying reinforcing uh, the agents of change and those decision makers that will be found in different parts of government of parliament and certainly of um, our, our uh, communities in reducing the cost of access to many of these facilities there has been much uh, discussion on this in the current uh, financing for development and in particular when we have spoken about remittances and the value that that will bring um, both uh, in a global context um, and how to do that and where we would find the most uh, advantage uh, um, coming from in terms of the possibilities solutions we need i think we know the what the how um, and the how as it represents different regions in the world who have a different level of being able to address this different sets of priorities uh, different regulations and policy frameworks that need to come together to make this happen so it is quite clear that inclusion is going to be a big part of this new agenda financial inclusion social and economic inclusion and i believe that um, the upu will be in a good place uh, as you think through being fit for purpose for this how will you engage with the un system that we become the facilitators of ensuring that this new agenda is an integral part of what countries visions and plans will integrate um, how can we then uh, lend from your toolkit improve it deepen it broaden it um, make it usable and accessible for many more new players that will come into this. It is really an exciting moment right now. Um, I think there are many who are thinking we do have uh, a big sense of what's coming down the road. The 17 goals that we have will be the ingredients that we use uh, for this new agenda. We have yet to um, finish really fashioning out the means of implementation, which, um, as I heard in the session before, the digital divide really being closed, but the role of technologies in all of this as a means of implementation, bringing that to the fore and using that much more effectively uh, to bring these different stakeholders together. It's, uh, it's a clearly um, exciting because it is the first time that we can in this generation end poverty. It's also the first time that we can really um, come together to see that we have a meaningful agreement on climate change and we bridge the conversation that sustainable development is the overarching um, narrative that we need to achieve both the eradication of poverty and certainly the climate change deal that we need going forward. UPU does have a big role to play here, I think, in the strategy of what you've learned so far in addressing the MDGs, but in a much bigger and more integrated agenda, uh, bringing the role um, of your, uh, your, your partners in this uh, to to, to participate in this discussion, and I hope to continue to engage um, all the way through to the end of this year when we should have uh, three very important outcomes uh, for the next 15 years. Thank you. Well, thank you. Well, th thank you, Ms. Mohammed, for this presentation. I'll, I'll ask you a quick question now because I think you have other meetings to attend. Uh, according to you, in what ways do you think that the UPU could engage or can engage in the post-2015 development agenda? I think they already have been. We have seen quite an, an incredible um, uh, engagement, both at the level of uh, the United Nations and in the different uh, negotiating processes that we've had here but also internally um, within the um, technical support team that has brought on expertise to inform uh, much of the how. I think going forward it is to continue to bridge what is happening here in New York with what is happening at the country level. I think that we're not quite there yet in understanding what it is that is going to come through the door come, post, uh, come January 2016. So I think it would be um, essential for you to engage um, again with the stakeholders at the country level uh, and discuss the implications of this agenda going forward. I think it's really important that we get a conversation going at the country level, um, really noting the different levels that we are all at. Not everyone has got the same situation. Not everyone has access to the same level of expertise, uh, institutions, um, and certainly players. And so to come bring that multi-stakeholder uh, grouping together and using the platforms of the UN uh, that this has already begun with, 
bringing together, as I said, business, bringing together um, different stakeholders and civil society um, as we see what would be an implementation plan, what would it look like. Please let's underscore the importance of the transition. This is a really big agenda. Um, it will require a lot of capacity building, um, a lot of facilitation and tools to address an integrated approach to this. So we do see that over the next two to five years, a real deepening of this, but to start, as we would say yesterday, and what are the implications of this new agenda, and can you begin to speak with your partners, uh, broadening that base um, at the country level? This is where we really need to make the connection. So we don't repeat the mistakes of bringing a prescription from New York, but rather that this is um, a part of what we have engaged in, and we can hit the ground running. Well, thank you very much for this precision. Ms. Mohammed, and have a great day in New York. <laughs> I think you won't be able to stay with us. Thank you very much. Well, we're now going to continue this discussion with the Minister of Post and Information Communication Technologies of Côte d'Ivoire, Mr. Bruno cabani Kone, who has a wealth of experience in the area of posts and telecommunications, because before becoming minister, he was the Regulatory Affairs Director of the Africa, Middle East and Asia region for France Telecom, telecommunication sector. The... Uh, Audit and Finance uh, Delegate uh, Director of France Telecom and the Director General of the Telecom Sector and Communications in Côte d'Ivoire. And he is also the President of this conference. Thank you. Bonjour, bonjour. Well, hello again, everybody. Sustainable development has become a vital part of business for the postal sector and something we've been hearing since this morning. It's something that has helped us to improve relations with partners, create new markets, uh, respond to clients' expectations better, develop uh, our activities more effectively and ensure that our employees are more fulfilled, uh, raise awareness uh, of environmental and social issues among the public. Sustainable development is also seen as uh, an economic lever for um, the development of our posts. Since the Doha Congress in 2012, a uh, number of uh, activities have been launched uh, in the following areas. The environment. The UPU's activities, such as uh, an exchange of good practices uh, with regard to uh, uh, reducing greenhouse emissions in the postal sector, efforts to achieve uh, climate neutrality in the International Bureau of the UPU, strengthening cooperation with uh, United Nations agencies, including the United Nations Environmental Program and the International Civil Aviation Authority need to be strengthened. The second issue connected with social affairs. Uh, now, we need to continue with awareness raising activities uh, uh, with regard to uh, infection of uh, HIV AIDS and now Ebola. Of course, we need to extend those procedures to non-communicable diseases. And we also need to continue implementing the action plan that was drawn up by the uh, International Labour Organization in uh, collaboration with the UPU on employment and decent work. We also need to ensure that our posts are responsible in uh, promoting a social dialogue uh, and enabling their employees and uh, enabling their even more numerous clients to achieve a better standard of health. And that's something that all responsible, socially responsible enterprises need to be involved with, and I think that posts need to be socially responsible. The issue I would like to focus on in particular is uh, the third uh, pillar, if you like, the economy. And there, I think this must be the at the forefront of uh, posts' agendas. Posts need to become effective businesses. We need to be viable. We need to ensure that our activities are profitable and uh, we need to uh, promote the economic development of our countries and create jobs. With regard to the environment, of course, we need to have a responsible uh, purchasing policy, develop uh, socially responsible products uh, such as microcredits, uh, microloans and uh, financial services, uh, which are both uh, affordable and accessible. But we also need to ensure that each of these activities, whoever is benefiting from them remains profitable and continue to generate wealth for our posts. And this, I'm sure, will help to ensure that posts are key 
economic operators uh, and socially responsible ones um, in terms of an awareness of their environment. So these are our good intentions, but we need to ensure that they are uh, translated into action. And uh, many of the posts in our countries are trying to ensure that that is the case, in particular in the countries of the north. But we need to wonder how relevant these activities are for poorer countries in the south. We have uh, different priorities, which tend to be focused on economic objectives. I want to be frank with you, and I want to be constructive. I'm trying to be pragmatic and frank about these issues that are sometimes dealt with in a very philosophical manner. With regard to the environment and sustainable development, of course, we all think that we're all in the same boat. And uh, it's a matter for all of us, and I believe in the issue of joint responsibility. But I think, as I said earlier, uh, we need to focus on economic targets in the context of post. And we've been adopting this uh, approach in terms of uh, uh, ITCs, uh, the development of the internet. We need to ensure that our posts are in the service of society and other economic operators so that we can create value and wealth and help to create jobs. That's why we have very pragmatic proposals. Some would say some of our, uh, our proposals are too down to earth. But what we're trying to do is to ensure that we use post offices to have uh, um, community um, cyber cafes we need to develop our postal networks to the benefit of SMEs and indeed uh, to help uh, individuals such as uh, farmers and uh, people involved in handicrafts. Post offices can also be used to create uh, financial inclusion and uh, uh, this is an issue that's been dealt with uh, by a previous panel earlier. Most of our countries, less than 10% of people, have access to banking services and in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, today, there are about 8 billion CFA worth of transactions a day on our electronic networks. That's about 2 million euros a day. That's about 4 billion euros a year. And those were services that were link only launched about 2 or 3 years ago. But now only about uh, a quarter of uh, our customers uh, use these services. So you see that there is tremendous potential uh, if you look at the 22 million uh, mobile phone users in Cote d'Ivoire today and when they start to use those services that's 22 million uh, mobile phone users uh, which means that uh, there is tremendous potential so the use of post offices uh, for providing administrative services and I think uh, the Director General of our posts has also talked about this earlier we're also trying to ensure that uh, we uh, digitize our services uh, 300 of our information services um, where we provide information uh, on behalf of the government to the, uh, and, and the state to, to our people are now digitized and we are trying to have a more interactive uh, dialogue with, the, uh, with our customers over I the internet so we use the post in order to carry out uh, awareness raising campaigns, as I said earlier, with regard to the prevention of HIV AIDS spread and now Ebola. So to conclude, um, I would like to say that obviously we welcome the setting up of the Carbon Fund, which is designed to uh, promote the development of uh, more environmentally friendly services. And we do hope that that fund will help to... Um, uh, go further than the efforts already made by many developing countries. Uh, China Post um, is today providing um, basic commodities free of charge to, for, to poor women in China um, uh, that have been given by donors. And Chile are now um, uh, handing out uh, Christmas presents to the young children. So these are very small um, aspects in terms of cost, but they're very important in terms of the social impact. And I'd like to welcome as well the efforts of some developed country po posts to help to support developing countries, uh, such as the Austria Post, which has financed uh, um, projects in Mali and Ghana for uh, um, ovens which are 
50% um, more um, efficient than, than old ovens. And they help to reduce the amount of wood and timber which is used uh, by women for cooking in these countries. A lot of different countries, uh, on a daily basis, um, actually do follow good practices today. Um, that uh, they've taken from the lessons learned from developed countries. And our post offices, uh, for instance, don't um, use a lot of energy. In fact, some post offices don't even have electricity. And a lot of it's done through post offices, uh, food bo post boxes as well. This has been said by a number of speakers. Uh, um, the post box is a key aspect of, um, of the service. And uh, some countries are now going back to delivery in, po in post office boxes in order to uh, re reduce the consumption the energy consumption uh, because delivery of uh, physical mail um, uses up a lot of energy so in Cote d'Ivoire the business model the, pl the the logistic platform that we are implementing in the Cote d'Ivoire post includes our determination to ensure that this platform is made available to other um, e-commerce operators so we're pooling our efforts, if you like, and making our equipment um, available even to our competitors. We rent out some of our premises if we believe that our premises are too uh, large for the activities that we're involved with. And we've tried to uh, outsource uh, our uh, postal uh, sorting uh, um, offices uh, to the port area instead of the uh, airport in order to ensure that some of that is done. Um, uh, more effectively. So these are pragmatic measures that we've taken. Um, of course, they're not uh, huge in scale, um, and they may not uh, be uh, philosophically particularly interesting, but we are sure that uh, with these small steps, we are helping to protect the environment and uh, ensuring that we are socially responsible. And we are profitable. Um, viable in terms of a going concern. And then just to complete my um, intervention, I would like to say that we're trying to make sure that our posts are economic operators creating jobs and creating opportunities and help to improve the lives of our people, uh, uh, ensuring as far as possible that we protect the environment in which our activities are deployed. And uh, I have to say, to finish, um, that there is a link between posts and ITCs and the development policy that we are pursuing in our post um, is very much dependent on the strategy um, that we are pursuing in ITCs because we want to ensure that our effective postal network provides inclusive services and so we need to take into account um, the development of the digital economy and that's absolutely vital because a lot has been said about that here which are true for the post but which don't necessarily take into account that beyond the postal sector we need to have an effective ITC infrastructure to help us in the post achieve our objectives in a lot of developing countries that's not yet the case and this is a very fertile um, uh, area um, we need to have an effective regulatory structure for um, uh, for these new ITCs. This is something that uh, uh, is helping inclusion, um, accessibility to services is facilitated. And that's why we hope uh, to um, create 300 new cyber cafes in Cote d'Ivoire. We need to achieve, uh, we need to attract people to the use of ITCs, in particular in rural areas, because they'll come back to use postal services if they are um, um, connected. And uh, so uh, these are steps that we're taking to pursue our ITC and postal objectives commonly. So there's a long way to go. It's a long and winding road. and uh, But we are determined to get there, because we think that this will help our peoples, and we, help that, and we think this will help our states. Um, we really don't have any other choice um, but to pursue this strategy. Thank you. Merci à vous. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Thank you. Thank you. And I do hope that these uh, uh, are 
initiatives that uh, you were taking uh, deliberately and uh, uh, not just because you don't have electricity in your post office. To our minister, now we're going to be listening to our, a union representative, so to, to balance the speeches. Mr. Philip Jennings, he's the Secretary General of Uni Global Union. He's been at the head of the Uni Global Union since its creation in the year 2000 and described as the labor movement's global warrior. His organization represents the service sector and counts 20 million members in 150 nations and 900 unions. Mr. Jennings accepted the nomination of UN Secretary General Ban Ki-moon to serve a three-year term on the board of the UN Global Compact. He also received the Nagasaki International Peace and Friendship Prize. Please welcome him. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everybody, and thank you for those very kind words of uh, introduction. And I, I'm sure that the paradox of being termed a global warrior and receiving a peace award from Nagasaki is not lost on the observant of you. I wish you a very uh, a good afternoon. I'm very pleased to see so many here at uh, such a, a late hour. I represent Uni Global Union. We are the voice of postal workers in this global economy of ours. We are the voice of the 5.4 million staff and their families and dependents. We are the beating heart, the public face. If you have a strong brand as postal services everywhere, it is because of the people that you employ. They are the public face. They are the face to the customer, to the man and woman in the street. And I'm delighted to see that the US Postal Service has put a $3.8 billion valuation on the brand of the Postal Service. The trade unions in America will take credit for this. And no doubt this will be an essential ingredient to the next round of pay negotiations. Worldwide, we organize. We negotiate, we promote, we take a stand, but we are partners for the growth of this sector. This is a big year for all of us. This is a year of what I would say is a planetary reset with the climate change talks, the financing for development talks, and above all, sustainable development. The question to all of us as leaders now is what did we do when we were challenged so to save this planet, to finance development, and to make sure that people were at the center of a new and sustainable world. We can all agree that the Wall Street business model has not brought sustainability. It has brought financial calamity. The question to all of us is what responsibility Will we take? Will we be up to the challenge? Can we, unions, yourselves, postal regulators and operators, can we deliver on this planetary reset? Martin Luther King said that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. The challenge to us and meeting that challenge is what are we going to do to deliver justice and to put people at the center of this sustainable development challenge. You have spent these last two days talking about the challenges. You don't need me to repeat them. But it's important for me to say, what is the pulse of postal workers today? Those 5.4 million people. I would say there is justifiable fear declining mail volumes, digitalization, a new world of work, fear, insecurity. What does that new world of work look like? I would say ferocity and resilience. Knock us down seven and we will get up eight times. Ferocious in our belief in the postal network. Ferocious in the added value that it brings to our economies, brings to business brings to people, ferocious in our attachment, in the recognition that this binds people together. And above all, hope, hope of new possibilities, 
of new alternative services, of hope for Post and its networks in the long term. Now, time is short. I would just like to leave a number of key messages to you. You are a key to sustainable development. The universal service obligation at an affordable price stands full square against the savagery and the short-termism of financial markets, of the business of business just being business. I don't think that is your business. You have broader societal obligations and responsibilities. Don't be knocked off course by come here, go there, political pressure, or by market pressure. Be resilient. Be ferocious in your defense of public services and bring the leverage and the added value that it brings to our economies. You are the bridge between that digital and the physical world. You are the bridge in terms of financing for development. And we heard from Aminar about the one billion uh, account holders in the postal services side. The bridge to families and communities, not just in the neighborhood, but in the global neighborhood. And I'm so pleased to see that in Asia and Africa, you've been launching new initiatives in terms of remittances. The message has been listened to at the G20 in Brisbane. I was there, and it's now got a priority at a global level where it did not have it before. I also think that in this process, you don't need me to repeat all the good things that have been said about the role that Post can play in reducing its carbon footprint. Therefore, I think that you have to present yourselves as a key in sustainable development. Don't be modest. Take a stand that when your government is talking about its plan for sustainable development, that you have to be seen as a key actor. Don't be modest. Take a stand. In the sustainable development goals, they talk about people and democracy. This has to be a sector where no human rights are questioned in the postal services, that every worker, if they desire, should be a member of a union and should be able to join a union free from fear and intimidation and victimization. That we are now in a new era within the United Nations system with the ruggy principles of business and human rights. And that sense of the, of the due diligence you will now be obliged as employers to have due diligence in the extent to which you respect the human rights of the employees that you employ. Therefore, no postal operator or some of those large private sector integrators should be acting inconsistently with those principles. That there should be no union busting, no intimidation, I am getting fed up of the calls that I receive from around the planet saying, Philip, my right to join a union is questioned. Why should I be thrown in front of a tribunal because I stood up for my people? Set the example in this postal sector that you will exercise due diligence to respect the rights of people to organize. And also that we will take those agreements globally. I'd be clear, we want a global agreement with DHL, with FedEx, with UPS, with Geopost and others to begin a conversation about how we can put some of these principles into practice. We realize when we look at the distribution of wealth in our economies, this is my point number three, can we be inclusive in this sector? Tomorrow there's a day of action, it's called 15 for 15, that is the push by workers at the lower end of the wage scale who, who basically live in poverty in the world's richest economy. People working at McDonald's and Walmart at airports and cleaners and security guards have decided in 200 cities and in 150 nations around the world to take a stand to say that the wealth being produced is not being distributed fairly. And therefore, I think in the postal service, that you can also be an example in those sustainable development goals of the importance of collective bargaining and to ensure that no postal worker in employment is living in poverty. This can be done. There is enough wealth in this sector, and as far as we're concerned, one of the key ways 
of achieving this is through collective bargaining. In conclusion, the role of the UPU. I see the Sustainable Development Goals as being a very significant part of your future evolution and development. I would say you must care about these goals and ask ourselves the question, we want to make an impact, not just to listen to the music, but to make the music that you say clearly without fear, but with great ambition, we want to make an impact, that you will measure the results of the work that you do. And you will report back to one another on the progress being made. There are 17 goals in the SDGs, as Amina mentioned. Let's have a UPU 17 goals. Let's take some yardsticks from within those 70 goals. I'm not saying the whole piece of 169 to report on progress, to show that you are making the contribution in this direction. We welcome the dialogue that we have with the UPU. We welcome the continuation with your Director General Bishar Hussein and with Pascal Cliver and the Bureau and the Secretariat. They are open to our ideas and open to our participation. We are delighted to have the social dialogue in Asia, in the Americas, in Africa and in Europe. These are platforms, these are bridges towards the achievement of sustainable development goals. And we welcome this partnership and we seek to work with you. I started with Martin Luther King and I'll finish with Martin Luther King when he said that injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. The challenge to us in this period of implementing the sustainable development goals is that all of us work together to ensure not just the future of posts and decent work, but that there is justice everywhere. Thank you. Thank you. Design. Now, if you ever wondered uh, whether the international peace recipient or the global warrior would suit best uh, Philip Jennings, I suppose you have the answer, as we all do. <laughs> We'll go on now with our next speaker, who uh, is with us through a pre-recorded message, is uh, Achim Steiner, the Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Program, the UNEP, and Under Secretary General of the United Nations. He couldn't make it to Geneva, so he sent us a video. Achim Steiner has been uh, heading the UNEP since uh, 2006 and will do so until June 2016. And prior to joining the UNEP, Mr. Steiner served as Director General of the International Union for Conservatory of Nature. He also was Secretary General of the World Commissions of Dams. Here is his message. Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, Director General of the Universal Postal Union, my fellow panelists. Let me begin by thanking you for this opportunity to join this panel and also the discussion in the context of the UPU Sustainable Development Working Group, and in particular, the reflections upon how the Universal Postal Union's global community can be part of a response to climate change, both in terms of managing the risks, but also in realizing the opportunities that these responses offer to us and above all, to make the universal postal community part of the capacity to respond to what is ultimately a sustainable development challenge. I want to begin by commending the partnership that we have enjoyed between the United Nations Environment Programme and the Universal Postal Union for quite a number of years now. And I'm grateful for the Director General for having continuously provided both direction and momentum to build on both the successes that we have had in the past in working together, but more importantly in guiding our collaboration for the future. I'm fully conscious of the fact that for many of you who work in the postal services across the world, the question of whether sustainable development and indeed the challenge of climate change belong into the mainstream of your work. I would begin by saying that first of all, if not you and if not me, then who else? If not us and only them, would we indeed be able to respond both to the basic tenets of sustainable development also hopefully out of the September summit a new set of sustainable development goals and ultimately also our collective capacity to address the challenge of climate change. It is everyone's responsibility and therefore I would appeal to you that 
in the way that you have already framed both your work on sustainable development, but also the steps you have taken in addressing the issue of greenhouse gases and also the opportunities for both reducing carbon emissions and then examining the options of mitigation and offsets really do belong into the mainstream of the business strategy of any postal service. But let me also try and bring perhaps a few encouraging aspects that make this not an effort that would detract you from essentially delivering an effective and efficient postal service across the globe, but to make the response and also the objectives of sustainable development and addressing climate change an opportunity for an even more effective, efficient and responsible Universal Postal Union community. The beginnings of this really are, first of all, to establish what is our footprint. And I think many of you will have been surprised that indeed postal services across the world are not an insignificant contributor alongside many other sectors to our collective emissions of CO2 and greenhouse gases. Therefore, we are all part of both the problem, but more importantly, we will become part of the solution. You have already taken a number of steps in terms of getting postal service at the national level to establish their greenhouse gas footprint, and I want to commend you for this, because without measuring and establishing and positioning your individual entities along the scale of whether you are a low emitter or a high emitter, it is very difficult to even begin to talk about measures that could be taken. We are continuously evolving the greenhouse gas inventory and the methodologies, and I'm very grateful and also commend UPU for having been part of this effort. I also want to congratulate many of your postal services. The members of UPU have already begun to undertake this work. It continues to build our capacity to respond, both based on science and empirical evidence, rather than speculation or aspiration only. A second step clearly is how we can mitigate and ultimately also manage down our emissions footprint. And here, what has emerged in recent years, first of all, through the experience of many pioneering actors in our economies and societies, north and south, large economies and small economies, is actually quite encouraging. Equally, within the United Nations system, we now have a number of entities amongst them, I proudly would mention also the United Nations Environment Programme, who are climate neutral entities. Far from actually making us poorer or imposing on us undue costs, we have found that we have achieved significant efficiency gains. And contrary to expectations, we have actually found that in many of the measures that we have since undertaken, we have not incurred additional costs, we have actually made savings. We have become a more efficient and also a more transparently managed organization. Whether it is in the context of our travel policy, whether it is in the encouragement of video conferencing, whether it is also in the context of managing our infrastructure, our buildings, offices, vehicle fleets, and electricity supplies across the world, the net impact of trying to make UNEP a climate neutral organization has been that we have managed to, between the year 2013 and 2015, to manage down our emissions footprint by a remarkable 17%. Even with the offsets that we have had to pay for those emissions that we could not avoid, we have found ourselves in a position where we have actually saved money. The potential for efficiency gains is quite remarkable. And I think particularly in a logistics and infrastructure-based service such as the Postal Service, and particularly in your global network of postal organizations, I think you would be surprised if you not have already indeed discovered this to be the case, that there is a significant potential for repeating this experience. But let me also be clear, the idea is not to be politically correct. The idea is to do what we can responsibly and within the context of the budgets and means by which we can act. The bottom line is that for the foreseeable future, many of our organizations will still have a carbon footprint that we cannot eliminate. And therefore, the next step is to offset these emissions through the kinds of offset schemes that exist today. It is part of taking a responsible role, but also to signal to others that we lead by example. We cannot always ask other institutions, other countries, other individuals to do the things that we are not prepared to act on. In that sense, I hope I can convey to you today the message that in measuring greenhouse gas emissions, in actually exploring the potentials for reducing emissions and thereby achieving enormous efficiency gains, and ultimately also taking responsibility for offsetting those emissions which we cannot avoid, we become part of a global fraternity, a network of countries, institutions, individuals and enterprises that are indeed becoming part of the solution. Our partnership between UNEP and UPU is one expression of this confidence in our ability to make a difference. 
We stand ready to work with you and also with your individual members wherever it is possible, feasible and wanted to try and explore the opportunities and also the boundaries within which we can act. But ultimately, let me conclude my remarks by simply emphasizing again how critical it is to interpret our response to climate change not only as a constraint or indeed as a cost factor, but as an intelligent contribution to the broader sustainable development agenda and indeed to the realization of the goals, including the principle of universality and integration that will form part of the framework within which all of us will have to act in the years to come. Thank you and I wish you a very successful meeting. Achim Steiner, Executive Director of the United Nations Environment Programme. Our last speaker now comes from uh, the Dominican Republic. Mr. Modesto Guzman is the General Director of Imposdom. Dr. Guzman is a lawyer with extensive experience in both the private and public sectors. It was a decisive part in the reorganization of the Christian Social Reformist Party through which he came to occupy a seat in the Chamber of Deputies. He's also been CEO of Imposdom over two different periods and his achievements have earned the Imposdom glowing praise. Mr. Guzman was also one of the main actors in the recovery of Haiti postal services and transport of humanitarian aid in that situation. Thank you. Apreciado colegas. Dear colleagues, I'd like to begin by thanking the uh, Director General of the UPU, uh, Mr. Hussein, and the government of Côte d'Ivoire, represented uh, by the Prime Minister, Mr. Bruno Nabanikone, the Minister, who have allowed me to come here from a far-off island in the Caribbean, bringing um, with me the Caribbean sun. I've been very impressed here. I saw uh, uh, the photo of an elderly gentleman who was being helped to write a letter. And I think that represents, it's very symbolic because it represents inclusion, because I think inclusion is a very important key word for the posts today. We have something uh, that we would like to say about inclusion in the Dominican Republic. No, you don't have that. You don't have the video. Are you chatting again? No, I'm not chatting. I'm buying on the internet. The Dominican Postal Institute uh, presents uh, in postmark, which is the best way to make uh, purchases over the internet with official guarantees. We are the only um, official way of buying products over the internet in the country. The posts getting closer to you. So I hope you like the video. Financial inclusion um, is a, a vital issue, and that's something that I wanted to mention. Now, the um, Economic uh, Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean has a lowered uh, economic growth forecast for the region, but has have said that uh, the Central American Caribbean region will lead economic growth, and the uh, Dominican Republic has the uh, uh, economic growth at an average of 5%. Over the past few um, decades, the Dominican Republic has been one of the strongest economies in Latin America, uh, reaching an average of 5.5% growth between 1991 and 2013. The Dominican Republic has excellent uh, geography, political flexibility, uh, secure democracy, and is a 
tourist destination for the region and for the world. One of the main challenges that we have uh, as posts in the short term is the need to adapt postal infrastructure to new realities and to the new role that posts must play. And uh, our sustainability will depend on uh, our skill in using the strength of the postal network in ensuring that it becomes a more effective logistics network. Uh, trends uh, show uh, that there will continue to be a strong demand for financial services. And Tamara Cook from the uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation said that the UPU will need to work uh, so that uh, posts can be included within the financial sector and that that will be one of the key factors in uh, trying to improve and indeed um, provide new postal services, providing a postal infrastructure that supports economic and political objectives set by our governments. In that uh, regard, we need to see changes in the region. Uh, we need to clarify the concept of universal service, universal postal service, and indeed the conditions uh, of meeting that uh, service, because the needs have changed in relation to universal postal services. Our view, our vision, um, is uh, that uh, our uh, Dominican Postal Institute can uh, help uh, um, support um, a building a more um, committed uh, uh, society and uh, we believe that uh, we will be able to help um, achieve the strategic objectives that have been set by governments. A great achievement of the Dominican Post was uh, getting the postal sector included in developing the National Development Strategy 2030 law, um, including the sector as a whole and supporting uh, the um, implementation of national development initiatives towards a better country. Um, we've just been uh, make, playing our part in helping to achieve the sustainable development goals of our country. Dominican Post has uh, in, made great gains in terms of modernization, greater effic efficiency and becoming more competitive, um, meeting the rightful um, expectations of our clients and users. Um, thanks to the strategic leadership, we have been able to achieve a strong position uh, and uh, um, a strong position in particular related to our economic activities. The range of products that we provide is adapted to the needs of our people. Um, two experiences that we've had have been in developing e-commerce through the InPost Back project and Export of Facile. InPost Back is the premium courier service of the Dominican Republic with international um, transport of mail and parcels. Um, and a service for e-commerce, uh, and it's 40% cheaper than um, services provided by our competitors. Export of Facile is a sim simplified uh, tool for um, exporting uh, commercial parcels, um, which is designed for small and medium-sized enterprises um, who want to link up to international markets. And um, there is guaranteed de delivery of uh, goods to all countries around the world. And uh, this is a, a tool which is designed to help uh, the growth of uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, and in particular from the handicraft sector, um, so that they can sell those products um, in foreign markets. Um, it's an innovative service, and it's a very direct, simple, um, cheap and uh, secure system, and obviously overcomes logistical and bureau bureaucratical um, burdens. Our view is that we need to ensure that all of our services help to improve the lives of our people and uh, promote social inclusion, um, which is a key aspect for national development. I'd like to point out and stress that sustainable development has become a key aspect of postal development, improving relations with customers, developing new markets, meeting the expectations of consumers um, throughout uh, uh, the territory, uh, promoting uh, personal development of human resources, and uh, raise awareness of uh, social and environmental issues among our people. We need to um, ensure that uh, productivity and growth go hand in hand with um, promoting more flexible and um, flexible work arrangements for our employees uh, and maximizing benefits of uh, automatic and uh, digital systems. However, to be successful, we need to ensure that this is uh, fair and attractive to our workforce. What we've been doing is reducing the use of uh, um, uh, motorbikes and 
by encouraging the use of uh, um, cycles. Um, and the French post has helped us with that as well. Um, we have non-communicable diseases in our country, which is a great problem, and uh, we're trying to in 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 encourage people to use bikes. Um, and um, th these um, health uh, projects have been uh, sponsored by the First Lady. I'd also like to take this opportunity to say that I am the Director General with, I think, most experience in uh, the postal sector here today. And I've heard a lot of speakers over the past couple of days talking about new ideas. And when I received the uh, invitation from the Director General, he said that this strategy context will be t conference will be taking place in the context of uh, permanent evolution of the postal sector and that we need to, to look together at the difficulties and opportunities um, faced by uh, the postal sector, and that's why we're here. But there's a vital thing that we need to do to achieve uh, all of these objectives, and that is faith. We need to have faith. Faith in the sustainability of the postal sector, faith to continue with our tasks and jobs, faith in the concept of uh, meeting customers' expectations, faith that we can do more with less. And I'm sending this message out um, to um, developed countries from, the developing con from a developing country, mine. Solanio Moreira um, uh, talked a lot about this, and uh, it's, he, that's someone I'd like to remember today. Faith is a key concept, and that's why we're here at this conference, through our faith uh, in the post. We've come from all of the different uh, parts in the world to be here today, because we all have faith in the system. And I think that's a vital aspect. Um, the Director General has faith in the postal sector because Mr. Hussein has that faith uh, deep within him and he has demonstrated that, uh, that he believes strongly in the postal sector. Ladies and gentlemen, this strategy conference is a demonstration of that faith and it's a clear demonstration that all of us are committed to the postal sector and we all need to work together in this because the postal sector will remember will remain sustainable if we all have that faith and keep that flame alive thank you voilà et après cette expérience so after this experience from Dominic Republic, I will ask you now to listen to the Deputy Director General of the University of Post Union, Pascal Kleber. Post, of course, is an area that Pascal Kleber knows very well. He began his career as a scientific counsellor with Swiss Post, becoming Director of International Affairs, where he took responsibility of relationship with the EPU, and many times he was head of delegation of Switzerland at the Council of Administration and the Post Operations Council as well. And on behalf of Switzerland, he took on the presidency of the Drafting Committee at the 23rd UPU Congress. Mr. Cleaver, you have the floor. Ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends, minister, panellists, ladies and gentlemen, and Director General de Colleague. Well, I always thought that Post was one of the most beautiful women in the world, but given the number of people who have been seeking our fortune in the recent years, we have a lot of hope before us. And I was indeed right. This is an essential opponent of the global economy. Everyone recognised this, as we've shown through the vision that we had set in place four years ago, that we set eight years ago as well in this organisation. It's a vision that we are sticking to. We are called more and more to react 
to this vision, we've included uh, this sustainable development component within this, and this is obviously natural, and it's a privilege of the final panellists to be able to react to what colleagues have already said. So I will try to do this. We were invited a few minutes ago to listen to Amina Mohammed. So the United Nations is a big family uh, we, are, we belong to. In a few months' time, we will discuss the Millennium Goals and called all of us to be at the heart of the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. POST and the UPU are already actors in the area of sustainable development. We've heard this many times and I will take up a few examples to illustrate this. So, in the area of posts, we've had a clear interest in sustainable development, in riding the wave of sustainable development around these three pillars of the environment, the economy and the social aspect. Of course, this is the way we will guarantee our future. For example, in the area of the environment, as uh, Achim Steiner mentioned a short while ago, setting up an environmental management system will help us to reduce cost. It's not just a statement. We have clear examples of this. For example, Australia Post saved $16 million between 2012 and 2015 through responsible management of its buildings and its vehicles. We also have the example of Samoa Post, a very small uh, post, but it has managed to reduce its expenditure, fuel expenditure, by 54%. Minister Kone mentioned the uh, economic models uh, that we could use. We can bring in the environment and the economy together. Philip Jennings mentioned the social pillar. He made an excellent demonstration and showed that taking into account social dialogue, diversity, and minorities, and long-term training, this can only be of benefit to posts. Here again, we have examples. And I'll take examples of small posts. For example, Salvador Post, in the area of access for persons with disabilities, to access to jobs and access to post offices. Well, it's not just up to the large posts to deliver on these goals. Everyone can do it. In the area of sustainable economic development, things are even clearer. An example of financial inclusion is a clear example here. We spoke about this this afternoon. Ambassador Lacey Swing showed the strength of posts in the area of financial inclusion of those who have previously been excluded from the banking system. And this is a real asset from the point of view of economic development of uh, countries and the policies for inclusion, as well as from the point of view of uh, postal revenue and income. Another recent example, we have produced a study together with UN Women. And this will be published uh, shortly and it will show clearly that posts include uh, women financially and economically much more than any other economic sector for example the banking sector i listened to uh, jean paul fosseville with regard to the capacity for posts to include people in in the financial sector Posts have been and will remain an area for public power. We will have been partners with the governments in many general policies, whether it be as an area of social transfers, administrative aspects, helping uh, organise elections, urban planning through addressing systems and others on a national level. Posts have already shown that they are actors in the area of sustainable economic development or even sometimes leaders, as has been shown through the example of the French Post, who has uh, taken the role of leader in the procurement platform for electric vehicles, which brings together many uh, companies from different areas. This is also the case of Mauritius Post, 
which was chosen as the main partner for the government's sustainable uh, development strategy. Of course, Post can do more and Post can do it better. The UPU is there, rightly, to guide them and support them in their endeavours. So, the UPU now. This area of uh, contribution to sustainable development, UPU is, of course, ambitious. Yes, we are ambitious. However, we must also be pragmatic. We're not taking anyone's place or any the place of any other organisation in this area. We're not the UNDP. We're not a large development agency. But we're taking on our responsibilities, our social, economic, and societal responsibilities, but of course environmental responsibilities come along with this. We know that working together, we can bring global solutions. Our strength is our global network this famous unique single postal territory which is set up over 100 years ago. We don't necessarily have the financial means or the resources alone, so that's why we need to set up partnerships and work together. We've seen these the last two days working with the International Organization Migration, I found UNEP, UN Women, of course, the Gates Foundation, and others I could mention for many years. We have continued to take significant efforts to, to convince our partners to work with us today for the benefit of tomorrow. So we need to highlight our strategy for partnership further, and that is vital. The strength of UPU is also that, that it's a global organisation that can help the postal community in its role at the heart of sustainable economic development. Within the famous list of uh, 17 sustainable development goals that are currently being discussed in the United Nations, I can say with certitude that either alone or more often with partners that we have in the UPU, we are active in 13 of these goals, whether they be in the area of financial inclusion, training, apprenticeships, growth and development of SMEs and access to international markets, also the promotion of, of investment and sustainable infrastructure, fighting climate change and uh, the effect on the economy and others as well. We are already working in all these areas, but of course we need to do more to show that the postal sector is an important infrastructure for sustainable development and social and economic cohesion. One of the benefits and assets of the postal family and of the UPU is also solidarity and the effective work we're carrying out in this area. I'd like to highlight the role of uh, Modesto Guzman, who worked hard with the moment when Haiti was severely affected several years ago. The uh, was the first to assist as well as with the US Postal Service as well. We uh, worked in uh, times of crisis in, in Indonesia, in Japan, for example, during the Fukushima disaster, we have assisted not only when crises have hit, but in the reconstruction phase, as well as with the uh, US Post and others, we've been in Sendai, the Global Conference on Disaster Risk Reduction. And we have shown the role that the postal sector can play in these times, these times of crisis, times of disaster, post as a structural element to assist. Post can also be an element that, to, that can highlight problems. We have a project that is being brought together with the World Meteorological Organization that we can use to warn populations when crises are about to hit and natural disasters are about to hit. So 
All these points that we need to bring together in our activities and our famous strategy for action so to ensure that we can be effective, so that the postal sector and economic development in the broader sense can be delivered. This is a contribution to the development of post, but also through a contribution to the sustainable development goals of member states. This is how the UPU will be relevant and effective. Strategy at the heart of our action, a global strategy that includes uh, elements and uh, context of our changing times. This is why we are not and will never work in isolation. We need to come together to bring benefits to our members to support development. Our strength is in delivery, in specifics. And we all our initiatives can be seen on a daily basis in economic and social life. We will continue to work in this vein for everyone. Thank you. Merci, Pascal. Thank you very much, Mr. Cleaver. I have one quick question to all four of you, a very quick one. And maybe, I don't know if the answers will be quick, but uh, you guys try. Uh, I hear you, I, I hear all these positive thoughts about sustainable development, about the bright future and the difficulties as well that the post is, will be confronted to. But at the same time, isn't it difficult, or isn't it even somewhat of an utopia to, to be willing to achieve all these goals while at the same time, the post main competitors do not play by the same rules, socially, financially, environmentally. How do you tackle that or try to tackle that? Monsieur le Ministre, Monsieur le Président, éventuellement? Minister, President, perhaps. Well, that's a really difficult question. And I'm going to try to reply to it. I was saying a moment ago that our posts have to be socially responsible. And in that context, they need to go beyond um, uh, considerations uh, restricted to profitability. It would be very difficult to envisage a post office um, um, that did not um, focus on um, issues of uh, profitability, because it would be dependent on the state. If it wasn't profitable or viable as a going concern, so you need to try to sort of um, um, square the circle. I mean, it's a conundrum uh, in trying to promote social responsibility, uh, social responsibility, and going towards the poorest uh, sections of society. So, uh, promoting inclusion um, while remaining profitable, and um, that is the question. Most businesses today are faced by these new issues connected with sustainable development. Most businesses today are um, accepting responsibilities which involve costs. I'm talking about banks, insurance companies, a whole number of sectors who are now taking mes measures to avoid being accused uh, of uh, undermining uh, um, sustainable development and uh, um, uh, creating problems related to climate change and uh, uh, ozone depletion. So we all have those responsibilities. Okay, we're all on the same boat. That's what I said earlier. And if there's a hole in the boat and it's leaking, then it's a problem for all of us. And we need to ensure that this boat um, uh, remains afloat. We all have our duties and responsibilities. Um, if uh, someone starts trying to uh, uh, make holes in that bo in that boat, and I believe that postal sector uh, that goes for the postal sector too. I'm asking the question, well, I, I would say you have this great, big, wide, wonderful, representative, socially responsible community known as the UPU. Strong in values, strong in principles, a very long history. Therefore, I see you as one of, as probably the most long-standing community of interest within the UN system, bar none. But there has to come a time in a world where the family has to take some of the difficult family members to one side and say, look, we understand as a global integrator you want to provide globally integrated services. 
However, that should be on the basis of fair competition. And we will not accept any of these large, globally, globally integrated integrators taking an anti-union message, undercutting what all of you are trying to do is to provide a service, a universal service, at an affordable price. And I think the time has come to think, to think very carefully about how can we deal with instances of behavior such as this. It's a question for your administration, but surely there must be a place where we can take these issues to you and say, this behavior is not acceptable. We know what the labor cost element is in all the contracts and the services that you provide. And I think when you are trying to provide decent work to your national postal workers, that when markets are open, and those markets are open to competitors who may be responsible at home, but are not responsible with you, then I think it's time for the UPU to take a stand and to try and find a way of dealing with these, with these measures. In the case, we have an interesting example with DHL. We have a number of issues around the world, and we've, we've taken the issue to the OECD contact point, and we are now in, a, what I would say, a developing dialogue with DHL to deal with these cases as they emerge. In recent weeks, we have FedEx and TNT. We have the new uh, situation with Japan Post uh, uh, in the process to purchase uh, Zittel in uh, Australia. And therefore, you know, this is going to come to your doorstep, this question of unfair competition. And therefore, you have to try and find a way of dealing with this within the context of your work on sustainability. Maybe controversial, but I think it's only fair to all of the decent work employers in the room that your decent work agenda is not undercut by unfair competition. Thank you. Senor Guzman, did you have to face this already? Okay. Yes. We are different. We do focus on the human being. Um, a lot of businesses only focus on figures. We, so, we focus as well on society. And that's our um, strength because the human being is, is central to our activities. We have always been sustainable because our main objective isn't just to make money, but it's to have a universal um, postal service. You managed to achieve that on a daily basis. We do manage to do that. And the more efforts we make at every level, we can do that. And that's our strength. That's our difference. Um, that's why we are different to businesses, because of the belief and uh, passion that we have for our sector. Others look at statistics, figures, cold numbers. That's not us. Pascal Cleaver. Is it up to UPU to try to fight uh, this uh, um, unfair competition? Well, UPU is an intergovernmental organization and its aim is to ensure that there is a global network uh, that is uh, operational. And even though uh, Felipe has been talking about, uh, Philip has been talking about um, um, talking to some of the members of our family and taking them to one side, uh, the fact is uh, everybody together decides on the rules of the game. And UPU needs to ensure that it uh, um, provides opportunities to discuss the rules of the game. We have a Congress now in uh, uh, 17 months' time, and that might be a wonderful opportunity to talk about the rules of the game and to um, get things off our chest. We all need to take responsibility for this. We can't substitute member states, but together we can... Um, put pressure on uh, uh, those who might uh, avoid their social responsibility. Thank you. Is uh, flying as I was saying. Um, I think we have questions now from the audience, and if I am correctly know what I'm talking about, I think the first one should be coming from Pat Mendoka from the USPS. Is that correct? No, no Pat Mendoka. 
Well, Japan also asked for... F yes. Okay, please. Please go ahead, then. Oh, open... Okay. There you go. Open your microphone. Okay, thank you. Sure. Uh, as, as you said, my name is Pat Mendonca. I'm from the U.S. Postal Service. I've been speaking in my role as the chair of the UPU Working Group on Disaster Risk Management. A recurring theme that we've heard at the conference is the need for the post to adapt and change in order to um, stay relevant. Disasters are events that all posts must effectively deal with in order to accomplish their mission on a daily basis and maintain trust. And as a result, the disaster risk management and building of resistance is very important to maintaining the postal sector's relevance. Uh, the United Nations Development Program has highlighted that every dollar invested into disaster preparedness saves seven dollars in dealing with the aftermath of a disaster. That's why disaster risk reduction is an integral part of the sustainable development agenda, as Pascal mentioned. Our objectives for disaster risk management are to identify ways for the UPU member post to share lessons learned, identify best practices regarding preparation for disasters and building resilience, as well as providing assistance for the restoration of basic postal services after disasters. As we prepare for the next cycle and identify the challenges that will be affecting our sector, disaster risk management can be an investment in the postal sector as a whole and the UPU member posts. So on behalf of the members of the Disaster Risk Management Group, I would like to appeal to all the participants here to support and promote our efforts to include the basic elements of disaster risk management and resilience building into the postal cycle. Thank you. Thank you. Any reaction? Does anyone want to react? No? So shall we go on? I think Japan also requested uh, to speak. So if there is any Japanese represented, please uh, open your microphone. Yeah, thank you. Thank what? you, Mr. Moderator. Um, but regarding a disaster uh, due to climate change and other factors, natural disasters happen anywhere in the world. Actually, there were many natural disasters in the world, uh, as Mr. Krivas mentioned uh, in his uh, panel. Uh, such as in Indonesia, Maldives, Sri Lanka, Pakistan, United States of America, China, Philippines, Haiti, and uh, recently Vanuatu, and so on, including our country. There are many challenges for disaster risk reduction which are being implemented as one of the important common issues in the United Nations. In this situation, last month, Japan with its initiative and collaboration with the United Nations, their world held the third United Nations World Conference on Disaster Risk Deduction in Sendai, Japan. The first conference in Yokohama and second one uh, in Kobe in Japan, indeed. In this opportunity, Japan would like to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Pascal Kribas, Deputy Director General, of UPU to participate in this conference. We recognize the postal sector has an important role and function to achieve transportation, financing services, and base station for affected community, even during natural disasters happen. So Japan would like to highly appreciate UPU's active role to play to establish disaster management framework in line with Doha Postal Strategy. It is important to minimize the damages and effect by natural disasters. The postal sector should improve its resilience for sustainable development. At the same time, it is efficient that the UPU transmit that the postal sector is able to contribute for disaster risk management activities to the world as its social responsibilities. Japan also would like to ex expect these points will be reflected to, to the next Istanbul strategy in the next UPU Congress. Thank you. Thank you.
Next uh, speaker, who, actually, next, 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 would you like to react? Anyone? Yes, I know France as well, but in the list I have, the WMO also wanted to speak, l'Organisation Météorologique Mondiale. Is there any Please open your mic. Je vous en prie. Yes, please go ahead. Turn on your microphone, please. There you go. Ah, merci. Thank you. Distinguished Minister, Director General, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished delegates. I'd like to thank uh, all of the panelists who've spoken about such interesting issues. And I'd like to come back to what Amina Mohammed said and what Mr. Steiner said about the contribution that uh, the um, WMO and uh, UPU can make for their members to support the Sustainable Development Goals and combat poverty uh, and uh, disaster reduction. WMO and UPU are two of the oldest members of the UN family and we're lucky enough to collaborate, work together uh, and have been doing for some time. In the future there will be more disasters in relation to climate change and postal services and hydrological and meteorological services in our member states uh, will have a great contribution to make to try to make states more resilient and strong and ensure that our systems are more effective even in the context of disasters and helping local and national governments to become more efficient and resilient in the face of uh, disasters. So in that, uh, uh, with that in mind, I can reiterate the solidarity of WMO and uh, UPU to try to help members pursue those objectives. Thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to the delegation of France now. Thank you. I'd like to come back to the Carbon Fund. I'd like to point out that it has two objectives. The low carbon uh, emissions strat uh, target of the postal sector, um, which needs to be financed by uh, posts in developed countries that need to um, finance projects on electrification and uh, uh, the move towards renewable energies or financing uh, alternative vehicles in uh, developed con uh, developing countries posts. Thanks to those projects, um, the developed world uh, can uh, demonstrate their carbon neutrality, so that's uh, beneficial for both. The second aim is uh, climatic solidarity, so the idea isn't just to transfer green technologies, but also to um, uh, transfer know-how. The Carbon Fund is the first sectoral carbon fund in the world which pursues these two objectives. It's a win-win situation, which is designed to help all of the 192 member countries um, to come to Istanbul and uh, try to support the implementation of this fund. Uh, perhaps it could be incorporated into the UPU and its strategy. But in any case, the postal sector, by adopting this fund, will be able to demonstrate at COP2121, the next uh, conference on climate change, that it becomes the first um, pro um, official proposal. It's um, uh, uh, something that's been announced by Ban Ki-moon, and it's something that we have uh, anticipated and tried to move ahead with. We need to associate quality of service with quality of air. Thank you. And I think... A oh, country willing to air something was Costa Rica. Is it the case still? Hi, how are you? Hola a todos y a todas. Hello to everybody. Costa Rica is in a region that for many years has uh, been struck by earthquakes and uh, volcanic eruptions. And that's why for Costa Rica it's vital um, uh, to see the role played by posts uh, along with um, um, local uh, efforts to combat disasters and their impacts. In 2008, uh, Costa Rica was struck by a terrible earthquake and thanks to the postal sector, we 
manage to achieve a, a tremendously strong response in the effective areas. And what we're asking from other posts, um, as the United States has pointed out and other countries have said, is, um, is to understand the importance of the post's active role in uh, responding to disasters with national disaster response committees. And posts can play uh, that social role that they uh, really have to, to play. Do you want to add something, Mr. Guzman? I can say that in the experience of Haiti, I saw that the Haiti experience was useful in creating synergies between activating a mechanism in which the United States played a very active role and other countries from Europe, in fact, as well, showing quick solidarity um, in the context of that disaster. And that strengthened or raised the awareness of all of us that we need to show solidarity in um, responding quickly to support countries that have suffered from the impacts of such disasters. Monsieur le Président, Monsieur le Ministre, je parle sous... President uh, Minister, we have uh, gone over time. Uh, do we have time to take a few more questions or do we need to wrap up now? Uh, I hand over to you. I, I, okay, well, I think we need to stop there. So I'd like to thank you very much for your attention. Um, we've uh, looked at uh, issues which are very sensitive and important for future posts and future of citizens. We are all customers. Uh, we all customers of posts. So we have benefits from universal service, and we, are, we need to look at aspects of sustainable development, of respecting the environment, and respecting staff and employees, and also the economic realities and profitability of the posts. These are all the different aspects of the same uh, same problem. I think. Through the different uh, uh, presentations and different speakers today, we see the need to move forward, and also the uh, faith and the trust that you have in your institutions in how the, the customer views you and the trust they have in you. I'd like to thank you very, very much for your attention. I wish you an excellent evening, and I will give the floor to the minister and the president for the continuation of this conference. Thank you very much. Je voudrais commencer par Well, I'd like to begin by thanking, of course, Mr. Ceruti, the moderator, the excellent way in which he has uh, moderated this panel. I'd like to thank the panelists, of course, for the wealth of their experience they've shared with us today in an excellent fashion. I would also like now, ladies and gentlemen, to invite the Director General, Mr. Bishar Hussein, to take the floor for some uh, overall concluding remarks and I will continue after he's taken the floor. So you have the floor. Thank you, Mr. Minister. Thank you. Honorable Minister, distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Well, after two days of very intense discussions covering the main issues facing our sector, I have been given the daunting task to summarize the work and the thoughts, the ideas, 
the suggestions, the preparations, and the presentations given by 46 eminent speakers and interventions from many delegates from this floor. Your Excellencies, I want to tell you this, that no stretch of imagination can I be able to summarize all the things that have been said here with the space of time that we have. And certainly, I will not be able to match the passion and eloquence with which uh, the great speakers before me have spoken here. However, let me take this opportunity, Your Excellencies, just to let you know that uh, I want us to have the same pictures speak uh, a thousand, better than a thousand words. First of all, let's have a quick reflection and see what has been going on for the last two days in, uh, in, in picture form. Well, I want to apologize that uh, we are not able to add uh, a voice to it, but uh, hopefully we are going to have that. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, I know it's late, and uh, I have a, a serious task ahead of me. Just to let you know that uh, nearly 800 uh, delegates from 136 countries, uh, this is a record uh, uh, strategy conference that we have seen uh, in the history of Universal Postal Union. First of all, may I take this opportunity, Your Excellencies, to thank uh, our, our host uh, government, Cote d'Ivoire, for really uh, taking leadership and organizing this great conference. Mr. Minister, on behalf of the entire members of Universal Postal Union here, I want to convey to you and to your government and the Prime Minister who is with us here our most sincere thanks for really uh, leading this uh, very important conference. Your Excellencies, allow me also to thank uh, the eminent speakers, the great men and women who have spoken here, who have made this very, very interesting uh, session for us. I also want to thank uh, our great panelists, uh, the moderators who have facilitated our work. Uh, this uh, by name, Mr. Mark Fuer, Mr. Peter Somers, and Mr. Michael Ceruti. I want to say, can you please give them a big round of applause, please? <laughs> These men have skillfully led our debates with great professionalism and dynam dynamism and efficiency. I want to say also that I want to extend my sincere thanks to the great team from the Universal Postal Union, the International Bureau who are here, who have been working behind the scene and who have made this conference a success. Your Excellency, first of all, let me just uh, make a short comment about this conference. This is very unique in its uh, format, in its structure, and the way we have planned it. And I'm very glad that it has come together the way it has. Your Excellency, this is complete departure from what we have in Universal uh, Postal Union, our normal meetings. 
Our meetings are very long and sometimes very tedious and very boring speeches, but I can tell you that the purpose of this conference the last two days was to make it very interactive, very, very uh, engaging, very stimulating, thought-provoking, and I, this is what I had promised you when I opened up the stage yesterday. This is our new approach to uh, running business in the Universal Postal Union. And I want to thank all those who are involved in making this a success. Your Excellencies, I have to say again that um, if there is one message I really want, because really, to wrap this up, we must come down to, to really what is the, the, what is the thing, the one thing that you want to take out of this place? And the one message which comes out quite clearly in my mind is that uh, the environment of the post and UPU we have been used to for many decades, and uh, probably about a century, has changed and is changing very dramatically. We must all adapt to these new realities for the posts and UPU to remain relevant. The big question is, which has been asked over and over again, directly or indirectly, is how do we do this? What do we need to change? When do we change? And by what means do you want to change? Your Excellencies, this question may not have been asked directly, but this is what we have discerned from the discussions that we have. The view that has come over and over again is that we need to change UPU and the post, and we need to change it now and not tomorrow. The question is, how do we do it? To us, what has come out here is something we have thought about it in Universal, in the IB, and we have trained this idea through our councils. We have also consulted our member countries. And when we came up with the three eyes, innovation, integration, and inclusion, to me, these are the fundamental three issues that really was underlined here by this conference during the last three days. Your Excellencies, just allow me to then at this point to highlight what really the great speakers have, talking, uh, have spoken about this. Certainly, this may not cover everything that has been said. I want to assure you that within a very short time, the entire report of this conference will be able to be available uh, on our website uh, for all of you to access, and that you will have it very shortly. However, let me say this, that uh, from uh, the technical team that has supported me really in preparing this report. The fundamental issues that come to us is that innovation, this is a prerequisite for the future of the postal sector. Integration of networks, products, and services is key to building a seamless postal network in line with the changing global environment. The postal services are driven, are drivers for inclusive and sustainable development. These are the themes that have been coming to us. Your Excellency, let me expound on this a little bit. The first message that uh, clearly emerged from our strategy conference is that we must innovate to adapt and indeed anticipate a changing global economic and technological business and social environment. With mail volumes declining, we must shift the postal paradigm and put innovation at the top of our agenda in order to take advantage of the new opportunities that are emerging around us. Consumer behavior is changing. Postal operators, regulators, governments, and the UPU need to think outside the box and design new business models. We have had several examples of posts that have transformed the way they conduct business in order to respond the new demands from custom consumers and to the requirements of the e-commerce. Your Excellencies, the last two days we have heard a great deal about e-commerce. E-commerce is one of the key strategic areas of focus for the, UP, for the UPU. Innovation in e-commerce area also calls for appropriate global response from UPU. Having had many interventions since yesterday and the affirmations of the panelists in the third session, I am even more confident and convinced that the UPU 
ECOM Pro program offers the right solutions and response to the market. UPU ECOM Pro provides a tailored framework for the development of international e-commerce through the postal network. The postal sector holds key, and with EcomPro, UPU has focused on the right things. This was said by eBay yesterday. An eminent speaker or panelist who has spoken here, Mr. Chopra of Canada Post, said, we can't be the network of the left of us. I quite agree with him. We must be not uh, be the network of only providing those left of us. We have the network, we have the reach, we have got the potentials, and we have faith that the post office can be able to deliver the best in the, in the market. Your Excellencies, these are clear and strong messages, and therefore it was urgent to act, and EcomPro presents a first step in responding to the needs of the international e-commerce. However, we need to go further to answer some of the concerns expressed. Uh, reliability of the postal network, adopted uh, remunerations, predictability, and clarity in the product mix, and achieving a win-win situation for the customers and the post are uh, among those challenges we have to tackle uh, as we move forward. We got the message, and we shall act on that. Your Excellencies, Communication technologies represent a tool and opportunity for posts to transform. That's what we have been told yesterday. And to offer and create new added values services. We had many examples from countries around the world of the capacity of posts to innovate and embrace new technologies and enter the digital space. However, while the posts are often ranked as the most trusted agency, they will face challenges in transferring this trust to the digital economy unless they develop a digital competency and ensure that they are able to demonstrate this uh, competence. We saw many examples of how the traditional postal business is transforming itself through innovation and market evolutions. All of this must be supported by enabling regulations. And here again, we are talking to our regulators uh, our debates have shown that there is a need for a renewed regulatory approach to the postal sector in all its dimensions. Mobile, financial services, logistics, e-commerce, trade facilitations, etc. The UPU will remain a partner for the postal community in these endeavors. Your Excellency, the next theme that came out quite well after innovation, what simply, in a simple words, what we are told in innovation is that we must innovate in our the way we do business, we must innovate in our, our technologies, we must come up with new products and services that meet the customer demands of today. The next thing, that's one pillar. The next one is integration. Unless we are integrated, your innovations are useless. If you have a very efficient postal network and your next country, which is next to you here, doesn't have the network, then your efficiency is all lost. And here we say that the second theme that I, we can draw from our debate is that integration of the network products and services is critical in building both seamless global postal networks and business development opportunities at the international level. What is needed is full integration between various stakeholders of the supply chain. Posts, the transport sector, and customs and border securities are all very important in our business. Developing interconnections between customs and posts is of paramount importance in facilitating cross-border e-commerce. Your Excellencies, the UPU and World Customs Organization have been working very closely together to develop joint programs and processes needed to facilitate the circulation of items uh, across our borders. Interoperability of international postal network is one of the main goals of the Doha Postal Strategy. As we have heard in many interventions yesterday and today, postal operators operations are increasing in complexity, integrated technological solutions based on common standards are necessary to facilitate global exchanges. Your Excellency, here again, the UPU is bringing concrete answers and solutions to the postal community by providing standard IT infrastructures, solutions, and services to designated operators. 
with UPU truck and trace services, which covers nearly 94% of the world's post, messaging through the post net networks, po financial payment services, and with IFS, we provide a full and affordable infrastructure to all regardless of their level of development. This integrated UPU approach is vital to ensuring both the development of e-commerce and postal trade facilitation at worldwide level. It must continue to be a strong component in our next strategy roadmap. Your Excellencies, this brings me to my third pillar here, which is inclusion and sustainable uh, development. Without any doubt, our conference has shown the postal sector's role as a driver for inclusive and sustainable development. Inclusion has been a key word in almost all our panels. The capacity of the postal sector to foster inclusion in all its dimensions, social, economic, and financial, has been underlined throughout our conference. This message is clear. If it is not us, then no one else can do it. I can tell you that. So we have just to do that. First of all, economic inclusion is very critical and has been underlined by many speakers. Inclusion of micro, small, and medium-sized enterprise in the world market is one example of how the postal network can contribute to offering economic opportunities. This was said yesterday. Secondly, the topic of financial inclusion of unbanked and excluded population is now high on the agenda of governments and posts, but also at the international organizations level. The postal financial inclusion is becoming a strategic priority in many countries around the world, from Africa to Europe, and from Asia to Latin America. This afternoon, you have heard uh, Madam Amina speaking greatly at length on how the postal sector can become a very important infrastructure for uh, providing this uh, 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 inclusivity agenda of the sustainable development, uh, uh, which is now going to be adopted. This is nothing new for us. The post has been delivering financial service for many decades. The UPU is very active in the financial inclusion field and working with strong partners such as IOM, who are convinced that the post have a major role to play in financial inclusion. Thirdly, Your Excellencies, through innovative e-services, postal networks are drivers for digital inclusion. The information society needs to be accessible to all, and the postal sector can help to achieve these objectives. The importance of the universal service in delivering inclusion was underlined. The universal service serves as an infrastructure that helps support the inclusion objectives. We heard today inclusion through posts represent a fundamental contribution to the sustainable development goals of the international community. Protecting our environment is a major component of the sustainable development goals, and the post must be prepared to participate and provide solutions in this area. The resilience of the post to natural disasters, as well as contribution to post-disaster response, was emphasized by several countries, particularly in the last uh, uh, panel discussion. That have, and these countries, uh, those who have suffered from such events. Here again, the UPU acts to help its members respond to these difficult situations, but also to serve their communities. Your Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, through integration, innovation, the postal sector will help deliver inclusion and foster sustainable economic development. Each element is dependent on the other, and therefore, we must all act together in all these uh, dimensions. Ladies and gentlemen, in conclusion, innovation, integration, and inclusion are, for me, the main drivers that should shape our strategic framework for 2017 to 2020. My ambition is for all of us to deliver together by 2020 a postal world where innovation is shared, promoted, and driven. Not a luxury, but as a reality for all of us. It is my vision that a postal world, we should be able to create a postal world where full integration of network at national, regional, and global level is no longer an objective, but a reality for all of us. It's also my vision that a postal world in which our sector unique ability to include populations, economic actors, 
and territories is fully recognized and exploited by governments, development partners, and international organizations. However, for us to achieve these objectives, Your Excellencies, we need to transform the Universal Postal Union. The Universal Postal Union needs to undergo a profound and fundamental transformation by 2020. We need quicker and more efficient decision-making processes. We need to transform our regulations and our practices and the way we deal with uh, these development issues. We also need to have a clear and adaptable uh, mandates which we can be able to implement. We must come up with a quick and concrete proposals for reforms. I want to emphasize here that, Your Excellencies, the change that we have all asked for here we have only a very short window between now and October. We must all act together very, very fast to come up with real proposals which can change this organization. And this has to go to the Council of Administration in October. From there, then, it can be able to meet the deadline for us to change these things in 2016 Congress. If we miss that train, I can assure you we have to wait until 2020 before we can take a decision. And I can tell you the market is not going to wait for us. Your Excellency, I, I would like to say that um, our, strength, uh, our, our strategy conference has paved the way to our next roadmap. The ideas flowing from this conference will be further refined through seven regional roundtables over the next couple of months before a final examination by our councils and a final approval by Congress. As a global postal family, let us not miss this opportunity to build an even, uh, uh, an even more uh, relevant postal sector and a UPU that is more efficient, transformed, and fit for purpose. Your Excellency, I want to conclude with final remark. The last speaker here who spoke, Mr. Guzman, said that we must have faith in the UPU. I'm a very optimistic person, and uh, together, myself and the entire team of International Bureau are determined. Your Excellency, on a final note, again, I must say that I and the Deputy Director General were greatly humbled, really, for the expression of support and the confidence with which you have expressed to us. This really touched us. For us, it was just a normal course of duty. When you elected us in 2012, we took the promise to be able to deliver to you a UPU. UPU and the post must change. For us, UPU and the post will change and together we'll move the world. Thank you very much for your attention, your excellence. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Félicitations encore au directeur général. Once again, congratulations to the Director General of the UPU, and I'd like to thank him very much for his excellent statement, his engaging statement. I'd like to congratulate him and all of his team for the boost they give us on a daily basis, the assistance they give us as the Universal Postal Union. So, ladies and gentlemen, I don't want to take up any more of your time, but I must highlight that there were two requests for the floor that we have not followed up on. We, so, we... Uh, what, with your permission, of course, to give the floor to two countries who did not have the opportunity to speak, Iraq and China, if the representatives are still in the room. Si ne sont pas là. If they're not here, I think our work is done and we can continue. So before moving to the close, I would like to, following the Director General, to state that, of course, there will be a follow-up for the strategy conference, the regional conferences that will lead up to Istanbul Congress in 2016. So, of course, we must take the opportunity now to give the floor to uh, Turkey now, the host of the conference 2016. So, Turkey. Turkey, you have the floor.
Il n'est pas là. If he's not in the room. Turkey? Turkey, you have the floor. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, Turkey. Uh, China? La Chine est là? We will host the European okay. meeting. Après la Turquie. Go on. In 2016, in Istanbul, uh, uh, the things, uh, the law has been changed in 2013, and we adopted new law. Uh, by this law, we, the regulation and the administration. Uh, <coughs> Operation site and the regulation site uh, has, uh, has changed. Uh, we determined as the regulator, authority, uh, regulator of the sector, um, and we will try to do our best in 2016 uh, to arrange the, all the things uh, about the meeting. Uh, we look forward to seeing you in Istanbul. Thank you. Merci, merci. Thank you. And thank you, Turkey, for those words. I hope we'll all see you in Istanbul in 2016. I'd like to give the floor to China now, and I do apologise uh, for taking us back. China. Merci, Monsieur le Président. Thank you for giving me the floor. We'd like to take this opportunity to say how much we appreciate the work of the International Bureau um, directed by the Director General, Mr. Bishar Hussein, and the Deputy Director General, Mr. Clivas. Since they um, took on their role, a strong management team, and indeed a stable one, at the UPU International Bureau is absolutely necessary. And we're convinced that uh, the Director General, Mr. Hussein, and the Deputy Director General, Mr. Clevers, are capable of continuing to lead the organization and help uh, the member states meet uh, all of the challenges that we are currently facing and promote uh, the development of the postal sector worldwide. Thank you. Thank you, China, for those very kind words. So, ladies and gentlemen, this brings us to the final straight of this uh, strategy conference. After that uh, engaging uh, speech uh, by the Director General, I don't think I need to make a speech, but I'd like to just say a few words, if you allow me, and beg my uh, beg your indulgence. We've uh, come to the end of this uh, 2015 World Strategy Conference on uh, the issue of uh, innovative strategies, integrated and inclusive strategies. And to deal with that issue, um, the UPU uh, developed a program uh, with nine panels uh, dealing with very, very interesting and uh, instructive issues. Having noted that uh, globalization um, lent, led to increasingly fast changes in the world, we heard that the postal um, sector w was part of those changes and needed to actually respond to those changes. By extending their networks, posts have a fundamental role to play in the development policies of our countries, in particular in relation to financial inclusion and poverty reduction strategies in our countries. Ladies and gentlemen, I heard often that uh, the postal sector is a postal family. And uh, the fact that there are so many and high-level delegations here at this uh, conference and at this closing ceremony, I believe, is clear proof of that uh, solidarity. Let's ensure that we work together to help our respective posts um, take further steps forward and rise to the challenges that we all face. 
ladies and gentlemen, over two days, we've talked about change, transformation. And I think it's quite obvious that change itself isn't uh, really a choice, but it's an obligation. The Director General has repeated that and has said that it's an obligation for all of us. Our peoples have legitimate expectations that our institutions, governments, uh, multilateral organizations have a duty to respond to. We have that obligation to provide innovative solutions, integrated and inclusive solutions to our peoples. The good news is that we can do it. We are capable of rising to that challenge, and I'm sure that we can do that if we work together. The world will continue to evolve, and so the postal sector needs to evolve uh, along with that and continually adapt. So far, we've always managed to do that, and I'm sure that uh, we'll be able to do that in the future. So let's remain actors and drivers of change in this world. Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished uh, delegates, I'd like to finish uh, on behalf of His Excellency uh, Alassane Ouattara, President of Côte d'Ivoire, and uh, on behalf of the Prime Minister Duncan, who was here yesterday, um, I'd like to express our thanks, the sincere thanks of Côte d'Ivoire to the Director General, Mr. Bishar Hussein, to the Deputy Director General, Mr. Pascal Clivas, and indeed to all of the staff of the International Bureau for the quality of uh, the way in which they have uh, welcomed us here and uh, the way in which they have treated uh, my delegation since we arrived here in Geneva. I'd also like to congratulate all of the panellists and all of the experts for their various contributions to the discussion and for the brilliant comments that we've heard over the past two days. And uh, I'd like to thank all of you, delegates, and I'd like to congratulate you all for your respective contributions um, to the success of our work. So can I have a round of applause, please, for everybody? When we leave Switzerland, uh, who has welcomed us so well, I would like to reiterate the thanks of Côte d'Ivoire to the whole of the postal community and to this country which is so close to our hearts. I assure you that uh, your hopes, uh, I think, have been met by coming here. And I really hope that uh, we've uh, done this event justice. So by uh, way of conclusion, I'd just like to say that uh, Cote d'Ivoire would like to reiterate its uh, determination to support UPU and uh, the international postal community in rising to all of the challenges faced by our countries uh, currently and in the future. And could I wish you all a safe journey home to your countries I declare this conference closed, this 2015 World Strategy Conference. Thank you very much for your attention.